You know what I like to say instead of bunt cake? I like to say bundit. Bundit cake? Just because of that silent D. I'm like, what are you doing there? Bund- I just want to acknowledge bund- him. He's bund- there. Bundit. <laughs> Even without the D, it's still a fun word. Just bunt. Sure. Bunt cake. Bunt is a very... <laughs> You never use that in any other context. No, I mean, baseball. Bunt, but it's different though. There's no it is. D. There's no silent D. I mean, There's no D, it's different. Yeah, that's why I want to acknowledge the bundit. <laughs> but that makes it sound like there's an I in there, I like bundit, like pundit. Bundit cake. Bundit. Bunt. Oh, that's weird. Okay. Bunt. The things you think about, Drew. Ah, uh, bunt. Ah. Uh, bunt cake. Are you ready? Are you ready to record? Number 80 again. Oh, God. Let's do it again. Yeah, why not? It was so much fun the first time. I intentionally forgot most of what we talked about. So I unintentionally fresh. forgot. Yeah. So great. <laughs> there you go. All right, let's do it. Uh, Welcome, everybody, to episode number 80 of the Goulet Pen Cast, where fountain pens are still a thing. I am Brian Goulet. I am Drew Brown. And we are here from Goulet Pens to deliver this casual and informal, tangential and extraneous, superfluous and extemporaneous fountain pen show where we talk about what's going on at the Goulet Pen Company and in our fountain pen lives. In today's show, we're going to be talking about what product has surprised us the most by the community's response, uh, if it's worth trying to repair a nib yourself. We're going to be talking about if limited editions are a marketing gimmick or not. Uh, what inks that we didn't like at first, but that grew on us, not literally grew on us, but you know, our, our tastes changed and we, we liked the ink, you know, that, yeah. <laughs> uh, we're going to talk about Maya and Rachel's college majors and how they maybe influenced the starting of Goulet pens. And we're going to be spotlighting the Puni Labo pen cases, which will be fun. And, uh, yeah. Before we get into it, uh, this is the second recording that we've done of this because uh, we had a little oopsie last week. Thank you for saying we and not we, Drew. It was, it's a, look, it's a joint effort. Mm, thank we, you. We take all the glory, we share in the glory, <laughs> and we share in the, look at this guy, whatever the opposite Class of act glory over here. is. Yes. No, I mean, we just, hey, it happens. We've recorded thousands of videos. Every now and then, we have a mess up with the microphone and record an entire episode and it have to scrap it. And that's exactly what happened last week. So, you know, it's all right. We live and learn. And here we are back at it again. So we should be twice as good because we've already rehearsed. This I can't wait to see cast. myself twice as good. I just, I'm <laughs> It'd be pretty good. waiting. It. Oh, I mean, yeah. one time through is pretty good, Drew, I got to say, you know, yeah, pretty, pretty solid. Let's do it again. Pretty solid. Let's do it again. And we're going to do it again first by starting with some feedback. Yes. Okay, feeding back to us once again is Arabelle Hotzapel, 2046. And Arabelle says, don't expect perfection. Oh, she's quoting me. Don't expect perfection, but you can expect us to care. Wow. Love that. I'm going to use it next time I have an intractable problem at work. Thank you, Drew. I don't remember. Oh, it was about... It was about the audio, coincidentally. It was a, it was about a different It was about audio a different problem. audio issue because we were talking about you're hitting the mic. Yes. And I was saying, well, we're not going to be perfect, but we will care. Yeah. Lo and behold, we had another issue. We, so we've, we've basically gone through every technical issue that we can find in post-production, yeah. pre-production. And what we found is that the problem is me. I or apparently, me. In, in no. Well, I mean, week, yeah. The problem previously has been me with just wanting to fiddle with my mic all the time and I touch it and then it just throws off the audio and does weird things. So I just need to, I just need to, I'm like a child who like gets in trouble in class and just, I need to, I need to like sit on my hands or something while we do this pen cast. (laughs) But it's never when, it's never when you're talking. It's always when I'm talking because Mm -hmm. then my hands just have a life of their own. So like I have to require, I have to make effort to keep my hands still. And then when I just get on a roll talking, they just they just do all kinds of crazy things, and I can't really help it. But well, I'm gonna try. To it's be something. It's something more for the viewing public to enjoy as yeah. they watch the pencast. Yeah. If you're an audio listener, you miss out on all of Brian's <laughs> fidgeting. So that's right. Too bad for you. Eh, um, but uh, Arabelle appreciated my uh, quote, yeah. uh, and uh, <laughs> I will say that uh, yes, you can always expect us to care, but you should never expect perfection. Then, so ironically enough, I, there was. I, I couldn't remember what the word intractable meant. I know we looked it up last time we recorded yeah, this. I still don't I know still what it don't means. Remember what it actually is. Yeah. Um, so we really did forget everything we talked about then. I tell you, whatever happened a week ago is like. Well, then everybody listening or watching can expect this to be totally new, even though we have done it before, <laughs> just because of our terrible brains. All right. Well, the word intractable, according to whatever Google dictionary thing, I don't even know what website it references, but um, 
It is hard to control or deal with. So uh, yeah, that's I was, in apt. this in this instance, uh, I am the intractable problem. <laughs> so we'll take well, it. We'll do our best, but anyway, we'll take it. Thank you for Arabelle. <laughs> also, Corwin GC says, "Get your kids together with walkie talkies and go mm. to the breaker box." Talking about um, electrical like home crazy, issues. Crazy. Yeah. Go to the breaker box map. and flip it off and find out which breakers go with which outlet, switch, etc. Mm-hmm. And then update the labels in the box and each and every outlet on the breaker number. Takes an hour or two, but saves a ton of time in the dark. I love this. Okay, so what yeah. Corwin is saying, just use a walkie-talkie to communicate with somebody yeah. in the house yeah. and get it all done. Talking about like the breaker panel that you have in your house and understanding which circuit flips off which because I had lost power recently. Kids walkie-talkie. I would have never thought That's about that. That's a good that. idea. The only problem is like I've tried to do that with them, even just like yelling. Like I've tried to do that with the kids or had them like whatever yeah. on a device, like a phone or something like yeah. that. The problem is like our circuits are not like one clean space. It's not like, oh, it's just the bathroom or the hallway or the whatever. I'll have like one circuit that controls the garbage disposal, the lights on the outside or the, the ceiling, back of the, the house. ceiling lights, but then the outlets are something else. Right. Yeah. Like literally in my kitchen, I think I have three different circuits. Yeah. Like I have a kitchen island and there's two different circuits on the so two outlets that them. are on the so island. you have to do them all. So, you'd so have to... I'm like, I don't even know how I would write out what is on each circuit. Well, what, I think what Corwin <laughs> is saying is you label your outlets. Label the outlets? Really? Mm-hmm. Oh, I didn't think about that. Um, and mm. uh, No, he yeah. said update the labels in the breaker box and each and every outlet. And With the switch, switch and breaker number. number. Yeah, okay. so he's labeling the outlets wow. too. Okay, okay. Um, I'll have to give this some thought. Now, that's know. not going to be very pretty unless you yeah, find some very, or, very small. Or like write it on system. the back of the, like, the electrical plate, yeah, you know, yeah. so it's like hidden. Because I don't often need to know. Well, no. yeah, I guess no. I don't know. I'm thinking anyway, like replace it. Whatever. Still, still some good ideas there. Okay, I'll think um, about it. And then finally, Killian Davis says, mm. "I grade quizzes in Drew's favorite subject, mathematics, <laughs> while I watch the pencast. Nice. Also, there's an episode of Teen Titans Go because we were talking about Teen Titans last time, where mm. they straight up explain the gold standard." Fiat currency and the Federal Reserve. <laughs> wow. That show is actually incredible. Wow. It seriously is. Every every time Archer watches that I show, get into this. I have to pay attention to see like what what like weird undercurrent message are they conveying in this episode. Um, and all of it's like super self aware too. So it's That's entertaining sweet. for kids. Nice, but it also kind of pokes fun at the superhero genre in general. But also mm. is you know very respectful of it in a weird That's way. Cool. It's a good show. It's a really good show. I'll have to check that one out. My kids have never brought that one up to me, and I've sort of had up my radar. I, don't know I think you like can watch it on or... Hulu or HBO Go. Oh, okay. For now. They keep taking stuff away out of that, Yeah, don't they? but it's still cool that you can find it two places. Not a lot of shows yeah, are like that. that's cool. Okay. All right. I got some feedback here um, from KSEC. says, give it the old Goog is now entering my vernacular. Thanks, Brian. Uh, as you see, you have been known to say that already. Yeah, I've already done that in this episode, looking up the word intractable. Uh, I just like to know things. Intractably Googan. That's right. So, yeah, when you, when you look something up, give it the Goog. Uh, Matthew Goldberg, 7347, says, I would argue that the best rollerball pen to use with fountain pen ink is the Pilot High Tech Point, which is basically the Pilot Precise that accepts Pilot ink cartridges. You probably just don't want to be switching between different inks too often. Mm-hmm. That's a good point. Cleaning, yeah, I guess. I'd never really heard of this pen, but if you, I looked it up and it was like, oh, this is literally like the same thing as a, a precise. Mm-hmm. It just you can take off the back of it. With, the precise right. is like it's like a it's sort of like the Varsity where it's like got the ink preloaded in there and mm-hmm. it's just meant to be more or less disposable. Yeah, so you can use Pilot cartridges. And it's pretty cool. And Pilot ink is pretty friendly too. So probably sure. converters too then. That is a good question. If you can use cartridges, you should be able to use converters. I don't know, yeah. Or refill the cartridges with whatever ink you want. Which is the better option. Yeah. Um, But there's also Iroshizuku cartridges now. Yeah. Which steps up the game quite a bit. It does. A lot of people actually mentioned this pen in the comments. Yeah. Which is why I felt compelled to add it, yeah. Well, maybe. So we are just just not in the loop. What's ironic is like we obviously are an authorized pilot pilot retailer we could sell it if we wanted to we could so i'm kind of surprised that this has not come up should we actually think about doing that no probably not i mean the worst of both worlds right it's funny because like we're known amongst pilot as 
like the only account they have to ever return G2s because we could we not sell G2s. Them. No like one bought it's them like the us. most popular rollerball pin in America and we couldn't sell them because we're fountain pen people. So I don't know. Let us know what you think about the high tech point, but it's also you can get them freaking anywhere. Yeah. So it's like what value would Why we would add bother? by having it? I don't know. Yeah. We don't um, have value. Yeah, not really. Um, okay. Uh, and then Dawn... Gilkinson says, unboxing of that fabulous 007 pen begs the question, who is your favorite James Bond? <gasps> and then Don says, correct answer is Sean Connery. I don't know how you feel about that. The correct answer... Sean Connery is good. Sean Connery is great. He's good. Like, how can you, you... You can't not love him, but... <sighs> a bit misogynist at times. There, which I know is like a sign of the times, but I'm also like... Yeah. yeah well, James still, Bond you know, is always... Yeah, the, you I've, know, kind of skirting always, that. I'm, I've never loved that about the James Bond no, character. I don't no. love the overt misogyny. No, no I feel like it, it's gotten better, but still could bit, be better. Uh, but Sean Connery, there are some moments that are absolutely unwatchable. Yeah, it's, they have not held up well. No, time. no, those are difficult to watch. He, he's still an iconic, amazing Bond, and you know his style is fantastic. The car back then is fantastic, mm -hmm. and most of his movies are solid, but. I, uh, there's, there's moments where it slips through and you're like, yeah, this was, they were not working to be progressive. No, at the time. certainly not. Kind of I, I think that, let's see, are they saying favorite or best? My Just favorite. Okay. Favorite. Well, great. Okay. Your well, favorite. Good. My favorite, um, I, I, it's probably Daniel Craig, but I have a soft spot for, um, Timothy Dalton. Yeah, because I I just I like I feel I, like he didn't get a fair shake. No, he didn't. He had one like really good on movie him. and one really bad movie, and so and then of course he was just there until they could get Pierce in and to replace me, him. So when, it was kind of like when, a backup. When people hate on Timothy Dalton as a Bond, I feel like it's people that hate on a one hit wonder band. Where you're like, oh, they're one hit wonder. I'm like, well, that's still an amazing accomplishment. It like is, to yeah. be a James Bond and like even to have like one movie where you're a great James Bond, like. That is awesome. Well, me. Lazenby like, just had one movie, period. Oh, that's true, um, yeah. Uh, that's so right. Dalton had two. So I like Dalton <clears throat> a lot, but I would say Craig probably my favorite. But of course, I have a soft <clears throat> spot for Pierce too because he was he was from GoldenEye and we grew up with GoldenEye. GoldenEye was pretty iconic. Yeah. It had a video game to pair with it. But it's watching it back now, I'm like, yeah, this is a little corny. Oh, like, super corny. Especially yeah. like, GoldenEye was like the best of his movies. And it's sort of like- They like, all just went downhill from there. Like when we were a kid, I thought Batman Forever was an awesome movie. Oh! And I watch it now and I'm like, gosh, this is ridiculous. It's unwatchable, it's unwatchable. Ridiculous. But as a kid, I was like, you know, yeah. it seemed pretty cool. Yep. I love Jim Carrey too. So oh, that's yeah. part of where that got. No, in. same. I yeah. love Batman for did you say Batman Forever? Forever, yeah. Yeah, Batman when yeah, that yeah. came out, I liked it a lot. Yeah, like Jim then, Carrey's the Riddler in that one, yeah. right? Yeah, okay. Yeah. But anyway. Yeah, because that was a right. Who, who's was, your who's your favorite bond? Uh for me it's it's Daniel, Daniel Craig. Craig. Yeah. Zan. As soon as Casino Royale came out and he was like parkouring in the thing, and I was like, oh, okay, yeah, like this is this is definitely a different, uh, you know, kind of a vibe. Yeah, I and think I, every... I like this is more like the grittier kind of raw nature of it. Yeah. If I'm in the mood for a Bond movie, every Bond actor has at least one movie that I would consider like watching. If I'm just mm. like, oh, I want to watch a Bond film. There will be one from each actor that mm. would be in the running. Like, ooh, which one? Because I mean, they do all have their merits. But if like more often than not, if I just want to put on some Bond, I pop in Casino Royale. That's a good one. Yeah. I think that's the best. That's the best one. Skyfall too. I love Skyfall. Yeah. That's a good one too. Both solid. You know what? I got a problem though. In the Casino Royale. Oh my. We're diverting from pens completely here. Are but... you upset when they ruin the car? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I knew I, it. That I knew it. almost ruined the movie for me. Oh no. Because they had this gorgeous they Aston Martin in there. They always the car. Not always, but like they had this sweet like chase scene for like 14 seconds mm -hmm. and then they just destroy the car. I was genuinely flabbergasted. Like I made an audible noise where I was just like, they just destroyed it immediately. And they really did too. That was oh. not CG. They really did. And they bought, they actually broke a world record um, for car flips in that stunt. That re they really flipped the living daylights yeah. out of that thing. <laughs> it's a world, it's a record for most like car wow. stunts in a, a most wow. flips in a car stunt. Uh, I just got, you know, I know thing. we're on such a tangent here. I have kind of a problem with Hollywood destroying sweet cars yeah. for no good reason. <laughs> They did it with The Rock. Do you remember that one? And the, with Nicholas Cage. Oh, a Ferrari and, and a Sean Hummer, Connie. right? Yeah, the Ferrari. Or Lamborghini. It was a Ferrari. Ferrari. Yeah, yeah, they just destroyed it. Mm -hmm. And uh, what I'm is only it? borrowing your Humvee. Yeah. <laughs> Fast and Furious, they destroyed the Eclipse pretty quickly right away there. They destroyed the Charger at the end. You know, they just love destroying really nice cars. And I'm like, look, it's like, I get that it's dramatic, but like the hero car in movies or like, 
uh, iconic cars and then just destroying them because I'm like, I know sometimes they bought a bunch of those cars and just just destroy the dart. Like yeah, they're gonna destroy like 14 of them yeah. for the movie, and I'm like, that's just really frustrating. Anyway, maybe, maybe sometimes they destroy like. Fake well, ones. it's like shells of cars and stuff like that. Not not the the James Bond one though. That was a real. Not car. the Fast and Furious. They really. Yeah. The when James. They, I watched a YouTube. Oh God, what a. T- I know. Is, I'm, I'm sorry. Such a tangent of a tangent James tangent. Bond. But like, legitimately though, I know you're not as big of a fan of the Fast and Furious franchise, but they actually make performance cars out of there. They have like genuine like motorheads that are tuning up those cars and building like legit street racing cars for those movies. And yeah, they have some that they're destroying and just flipping and you know yeah. crap. But like. They're not just made to look pretty. They are like actual performance vehicles in those things. It's very legit. The anyway. James Bond one, they had this thing in the floor that when, I think it was remote controlled, um, when they turned it, something in the floor just went boom, like a hydraulic oh, yeah. stamp and just oh, like yeah. shoved down on the ground that made it. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. They, they The whole like movie magic behind how they do like yeah. crash scenes and stuff like that is fascinating. But I love that it was all one shot. Yeah. It didn't care. Yeah. Like you just saw the whole thing like, oh yeah. no. Uh, okay. Broke my heart. Go. Okay. Anyway, James Bond. Yeah. New Dan- stuff. Daniel Craig. Yeah. New stuff. Let's talk about new stuff. All right. Getting back on track with pens here. Um, first thing I got to talk about is the Sailor Cocktail Pro Gear Fountain Pen Set Tequila Limited Edition. This is kind of a big deal. Yeah, because they've done, gosh, they've done several different sets. I think this is the sets. third one that I'm aware of. Third? Yeah, because we it's hard because we we missed many years of Sailor releases. Um, and so I don't know the full history, but we came out with, there was a set, you know, like what was it? The, oh, gosh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to fail to remember the specific names, but there was a blue one that was like the tail end that we caught it. And then it came out with the whole set of 10 that was all the past like was 10 years. Curazur? Uh, Curazur, yeah. That was like, we caught that one as the annual one, but it was like the 10th one of, of the a 10 year release. Yeah. And then they had a whole set that was everything. That was a gin cocktail, I think, right? Yeah, I think so. And then, um, yeah. And then there was another one. Gosh, I, I really wish I could remember the names of any of these. This is where Rachel, I've I've been around Rachel too much. I don't remember anything anymore. I know. She remembers everything on my behalf, but, um, but anyway, so we got this new tequila one. So we have the orange Mexican screwdriver, pink or ivory cyclamen. Which makes me think of Urban Rose Cyclamen. Yes. Uh, purple Lavender Margarita, Turquoise Blue Margarita, and Green Mockingbird. So these will be three thirty-six a piece. So actually, when we get these, we get them as an entire set. Yes. And then we have to break them up. So if you're going to buy individual pens, don't be surprised if you're limited on nib size options and availability of those because we we are not getting the opportunity to order individual pens of those. We're having to break up sets. So um, if you want the individual pen, get it as soon as you can because us and other retailers are having to break up whole sets to get individual pens out of them. Um, but anyway, still pretty cool. And I'm digging the colors. Again, with Sailor, I always am just like, how do they come up with these? Or you can just buy a whole set. Oh, that too. Then you don't have to make any decisions about which one to get. But, you know, it's, you know, maybe not the most practical thing for everybody, but uh, still, that's what we got. Cool. How about you, Drew? Um, we are going to finally have a new Lamy Joy. Ooh. Not something that happens every day, Brian. It is not. I remember the Joy was one of the first fountain pens I ever owned. It was in my first, I ordered like five or six pens in my first order of fountain pen things ever. What color was it? It was the black Joy, just the one that they had like at the time. Yeah. They've done a black and a white Joy, I think, and that's all that I can remember they've ever done. They did the All Joy. The All Joy. Oh, that's right. That was available. The one with the was regularly aluminum available for a while. cap. Yeah, it was a silver that's aluminum right. cap and a black. Uh, t- it was a- technically, that's that's like, you know, a different pen, right, than the Joy? Or is it just like a variation of the Joy? It's a, it just has the aluminum cap. Yeah. So. Yeah, okay. All right. But I th- and I, I want to say the body was like more of a, a matte Kind of rubbery sort of feel. Am I, I wrong? It did, I don't, I don't think it was I as ever, shiny as. I don't think I ever kept one of those. I really wish I had. I don't think it was as shiny as the black and red one. Uh, anyway, uh, it's been a while. So this one is going to be. Let me look it up on the old Goog. Goog it. Uh, this one is going to be a strawberry Lamy Joy. So this is going to be the Ooh. same color and you know um, plastic um. material as last year's strawberry and cream safari. So strawberry available. I believe there's going to be some limited nature of this pen. It's hey, a special edition. Sure, so we have the All Joy. We still it's do have it? currently available for sale. That's so yeah. funny. <laughs> that was like, I was looking it up and I was like, 
oh, goodlaypins.com. <laughs> look at that. Because sometimes it's like an old blog post or something, and I look at them like, nope, this is currently Somebody available. was listening to us and be like, I just bought wow. one from you. Wow. Oh, gosh. It's one of these pens we've just had for so long. Yes. But, so, yeah. Okay, yeah. So we have the regular Joy, the black with the red trim. That's that's the one I had for forever ago. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. It's like a, it's like a matte. Yeah. It's just a black matte pen with the silver, like an aluminum cap. There you go. It looks pretty good. Um, and the, those Old are... Joy. I've totally forgotten about this pen for a decade. I've never thought about this pen. So that... Wow. How much is the regular one, the, the red and black one? Same, $32. Really? No, 28. Okay, that makes more sense because this one's 28. Dollars, yeah. The strawberry is 28. Right, okay. Okay, so, so the strawberry, it's, it's going to be the like same the, okay. price as the regular plastic one. The wow. All Joy is still going to be a little bit more. So yeah, 28 bucks. It's got a 1.5 nib, special edition. It'll be around for a little while, but not forever probably. Is it so, just 1.5? Just 1.5, yes. Okay, because the regular one is 1.1, 1.5, or 1.9. You can get it in either. I believe this one's just 1.5. We have That makes sense. When it's not done, on, it's when not on done our the, website as of right now. So, well, it's supposed to be up there by the time this video yeah. publishes. So, then you'll see. But I think when they've done special editions in the past, like when they did the White Joy, I think it was just 1.5 as there well. So don't be shocked there. But these either new, way, these nibs are easy to swap. It's out. a new Joy. Hooray! Um, also, Ooh. a new Kaveco Sport in Toyama Teal will be available. Ooh, this one this at twenty nine dollars. So mine are twenty eight and twenty nine today. A lovely, lovely teal pen, and um, yeah, it's a resin pen, but it has um, it's it's a teal sport, so not a whole lot else to say. But it is a great, great color and a good companion to um, some of the more recent uh, uh, like uh, aluminum ones and plastic ones they've come out with in the past. Very this looks good. Very it's like a, te- yeah, they're it's like a deeper. It's got like more of a blue. Yeah, I think they're to it. They've been green. really kind of spot on with their colors recently. They've been. They've been kind of nailing it. Yeah, they've got that figured out. So that's the new stuff. Um, also, we didn't um, talk about them this time because we talked about them in other videos, but SC DuPont has some new carbon pens. So I'll link that below. Um, these cool things from Rickshaw, the gadget um, pen pouch. Those are there. That's $22. Um, and I talked too much about butter popcorn that launched and sold out. So ignore that. You're Don't buy butter popcorn. That. <laughs> Don't buy butter popcorn. Butter popcorn is the worst ink. <laughs> if you put it in your pen, you will uh, be cursed. As soon as we got it and it sold out because I wouldn't shut up about it. So sorry. Yeah, we, we, but you can sign up for the, the wait the list. The email list, yeah. And we'll let you know when it comes back because it'll be back. <laughs> it will. We just didn't have enough of it nope. for how much Drew is a fan of it. Oops. Well, well. All right. Happens. Cool. We good? Q&A, man. All right. Let's do it. Here we go. We're going to A the Q. Okay. And this question is so interesting, Brian. Hmm. Uh, when I did this, this was, I, I prepped this two weeks ago. Right. From home. Okay. And I forgot to bring my company phone, which has all my Instagram stuff on it. Right. So I needed to go and find questions somewhere that wasn't Instagram. <laughs> right. So I found an old Goulet Q&A that you mm-hmm. did from 2018, 2019. Yeah. And I found some unused questions in that document. Because oh, yeah. we used to like take all the questions and like put yeah. them into a Google sheet or something. So some of these questions. Yeah, we have like lots of unanswered questions. There we go. We're, we're going to have a couple of them here today. So, Just right. a, some of them are new, but then a couple of them are so not. Like, yeah, going into like the time capsule Yes, here. this one okay. from Alan happens to be an ancient question. So okay. Um, okay. Alan, uh, who is actually still a contributor. So shout out to Alan yeah. for sticking with us. Right. Um, asks... What product has surprised you most by the level of community response? Hmm, that's a good question. Mm-hmm. When I think about something like this, you know, what surprises me, it's either like gonna be really good or really bad. Community right? response can mean anything. Yeah, I mean, I think genuinely we're most surprised by things that we don't think are gonna be super popular and then it turns out they are. Mostly. Because oftentimes we're not like blindly optimistic of something that we think is going to do great and then totally falls flat. Though we have had that happen before. I was genuinely surprised by how much people didn't care about us carrying rollerballs back in the day. Um, This was a long time ago, 2014. Like what you mentioned about the G2s. Like G2 seems like a, of course we'll sell some G2s. Yeah, I was was genuinely surprised by how much no one wanted anything to do with rollerballs on our site. Now, it took us years to even want to try them again. And it's not like we went crazy carrying them. But we, at the time in 2014, we were, you know, we were still experimenting and expanding and trying different things. Um, So we thought like, well, if people love, you know, the Pilot Metropolitan and the Lamy Safari Special Editions and things like that, like the G2 is like, you know, one of the most popular rollerballs in America. We were like, 
we'll try some of these things just for the times when, you know, fountain pens may not be the most ideal situation or you want to gift a pen from a brand you love, but it's to a, you know, friend or family member who just isn't into the fountain pen thing, you know, maybe get a rollerball that you, you know, comes with a pen that you really like. And it just like really didn't sell well for nope. us at all. So Blop. that was a genuine surprise to me. Um, and so we gave up on them for a long time. It wasn't until we hooked up with Retro 51, which we started out with fountain pens, and then we slowly tried out some roller balls. And that's really where we've kept it for the last mm -hmm. several years. Yep. So that's been one thing that's kind of surprised me. Um, the few weeks ago when we mentioned the paper uh, stuff with the seven millimeter dot ruling. Right. I was genuinely surprised. I mean, I think we got like hundreds of yes. comments in that pen cast, which is weird for any pen cast. I mean, we usually get good engagement from you all, but ne I mean, it was like way, like multiples more comments than we typically get on a pen cast, um, largely because of that one thing. So we're looking at options. Uh, we have gotten some quotes from some of the brands that we, you know, have most ideally wanted to do. And it was like 10,000 notebook minimum type thing. Cause especially with a custom ruling like that, it's like, you got to print it on the, it's not just a different binding or a different format. You're talking, you're basically starting from scratch and having to do it. And it's just any, any minimum quantity on papers. I think we should ridiculous. get it printed on stone paper so people can custom grind their nibs while <laughs> using the seven millimeter. Yeah, yeah good stone paper, which like repels fountain pen ink too. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Nice plasticky paper Great. that just smudges and smears mm -hmm. and also wears and everybody and, and everybody will have a you know left or right foot oblique in oh, about that would be a, such a, terrible, a week that'd be such a terrible trolling like here's this ruling that you've been wanting so bad and we're going to put it on paper that just is the worst thing that you can have for your fountain pen not yeah. all stone paper is that way yeah, we're going to ruin thing, all of your yeah. nibs you have to keep buying more yeah <laughs> Ooh, that's a good thought true <laughs> uh no so i was surprised by that so we're still shopping options and stuff but uh message received on that one um, I'm still surprised by how popular the random ink sample is. It is by volume, like our number one selling product year after year after year after year. Now granted, it's an inexpensive product, but still, um, you know, everybody just really enjoys it. It's like, you know, just throw it in, get, get a fun little surprise. So it continues to surprise me uh, all the time. Um, and I put on here like the Esterbrook tortoise. There's certain like accessories and stuff that I feel I get surprised by more, mainly because we just don't have as much um, like a point of reference no. for some of these things, no, no you know, context. like the you know, Esther book, like to go pen cup thing. That's relatively new for us. It's like where we pick that up and we're like, I mean, it seems interesting, but I have no idea because there isn't really anything else kind of like it, you know? So it's like, it could do, could do well, could do bad. Don't really know. Don't really have a lot of expectations. So stuff like that, I feel like tends to be more naturally surprising just because we don't have as much to go on when we estimate them. So those are some of the things that came to mind for me. I'm sure yeah, a lot speaking more. of the uh, tortoise, the the book holder, specifically the B book holder oh, yeah. from Esther Book, surprised me. Yeah, I, I mean, could... again, no no point of reference. I had no context. I'm like, is I mean, this gonna be good? I don't know. And apparently, people were like, yes, I do need something to hold up my book because it doesn't yeah. do it on its own. So. Yeah, because we don't carry a lot of like book no. things. It makes perfect sense in retrospect. It's a very practical sure. product sure so no well, I, I get it but well um, in that one too like there's the fountain pen nib that esther Brooke which had. was pretty cool and that one we were like okay yeah we can see that making sense but the b was kind of like well i guess we'll try it. like i think the only point of reference we had was the b for the retro 51 b pen which we knew was really popular and people so like, like bees. we were like okay like i guess people are pretty pretty b forward in the pen community um b yeah, forward turns out like uh, it was pretty popular yeah so. um so last year we had the we started the refreshment collection of Bennu Euphorias. Yeah, we did the uh, co uh, co uh, cookies and cream milkshake, mm -hmm. the, uh, the rainbow slushy. rainbow slushy, and the ice caramel macchiato. Yeah, or uh, ice caramel latte. Yeah, and the ice caramel latte outsold the other two a ton. And, and yeah. I, it's a nice looking pen, but I did not think it was going to be so far and away the better of the three. I, like, thought, I thought the Rainbow Slushy would have been the more popular I thought so one. too, because yeah. that was more in line with Banu stuff. I'm sure. Figured people that like Banu would want something really sparkly, but no, like by far that ice caramel latte outsold the other two and it's still super popular Did right you say now that even the folks at Banu, that's like one of their favorite i think someone pens. told us that yeah like, internally they I think like sam they, mentioned they that, all yeah. like love that pen it's a good pen <laughs> like i mean I, I it was my idea to do the ice caramel latte you know so i was happy with it but sure. i still like it's brown sparkly and white like that's not 
I didn't think that would be a recipe for like the level of the success that it yeah, got. It so genuine, it's surprising in a very good way. For that us. one surprised me yeah. in a good way. Yep. Um, Credit to Banu, of course. They, I mean, we came up, we, no, we yeah, gave no. them I gave some them the ideas. idea. I didn't tell yeah. them what to make it look like. Yeah. Um, the Visconti Mirage Mythos really yeah. surprised me in a good way because the old Mirage, I was not a big fan of. So the new, they said, oh, new Mirage. I'm like, ah, but then held it in the hand and I was really happy with the build yeah. quality, really happy with the performance. They went with a Bach nib, which I thought was a great idea. They, they made a lot of things better about it's it. It's a great we, pen. Yeah, it yeah. is a really, I, it's the best thing I've seen come out of Visconti in a long time. Mm. I mean, they come out with some cool looking stuff, but this one, I guess from a more practical standpoint, at a yeah. great price point, like yeah. I was, that one really surprised one. me. Yeah. Now, I don't know about, but but yeah, as far as um, response goes, community response, that sold out like twice yeah. over. Yeah, like we've made videos on individual pens and stuff, and sometimes, you know, it's just interesting and people yeah. like, you know, you know. The, so that one, yeah. that one surprised me. On the not so good side, I was surprised mm. that Tibaldi didn't make as many waves mm. as I thought it was going to make. Yeah, For an Italian yeah. brand, I think the quality control is superb. I thought that the build quality is excellent. Mm. I had a lot of fun with writing with those, but they really only came out with two pens. And yeah. I guess people just didn't want to jump on that wagon. I, mean, I think they had more. We only picked up two. Oh, maybe. Okay. Oh, right. They had some, some weird looking ones, like that bamboo they, pen the with the little had tassel were, on it. Yeah, yeah no, some of them were kind of one. just like didn't really make sense for us. Yeah, I feel like they could have been... They could have been more, but yeah, some of them, sometimes yeah, it just yeah, doesn't, doesn't some, work out. Some brands are still kind of finding their footing. Or like a, a brand like that's been around for a long time. And yeah. there's other brands too that have been around for a long time that are kind of like trying to rediscover themselves. Mm -hmm. but, yeah. And also, I think it just needs to be said that Retro 51 can at any point fall into either of oh these categories. That's because a great point. how many times have we thought something was going to be excellent and nope? Or how many times have we thought nope and it was amazing? Yeah. Like I, some of them just sold instantly and then some were like oh yeah this is gonna be great and then had them a year later like we have less certainty about launching retro 51 pens than we do any other brand. so crazy because it's so hit or miss it really is um though we've been on a better track record recently with some of our yeah. exclusives and stuff the year um, everybody thought they were going to close their doors was the wildest year for them by far as far as like that was crazy because they were coming out with poppers like every month it so seemed that was what like three years ago or so or i don't remember like that. It, was, it was a blur it was around the kind of start of, maybe right before covid hit yeah um yeah even that like i would say even like in, kind of in that vein fire and dice like we put a lot into that design mm -hmm. hoping and thinking that it would be popular but because of what you're saying like the wild uncertainty that we have with any heavily themed like individual retro launch we always just sort of like cross our fingers and hope for the best and then that one hit and we were like okay okay and then everybody's asking for the pencils too and we were like really pencils and then we sold out pretty quickly and, and reordered more and yep. it's like so i was like okay like the pencils did surprise me a little i mean it did and it didn't i was hoping that they would be popular and it's not like everybody you know has it, whatever but it's like the one pencil we've sold in the last 10 years um and uh yeah so i was kind of surprised by the the pencil too for sure retro 51 is a wild card yeah yeah um and then the diplomat nexus too was surprising to me mm -hmm. i mean we made a video on that i I thought I did an okay job in that video. You didn't, but like, you didn't say it was the best thing in the world. No, I tried to be, to say exactly what it was. And it's like, you know, it's not the, you know, the it's not like an entry level pen. And no. I didn't try to make it that. But the video really took off. I think you did a great thumbnail for that one. And uh, it just, you know, for whatever reason, it just was really popular. And a bunch of people ended up buying it and loving it. And so that pen has like become more of a thing than I honestly thought that it would. I just thought it was interesting. So I made that video, but you know, it's kind of like you said with the Visconti, it's like anything that we genuinely find interesting at this point is like, okay, well, we'll just talk about it because it's like, I don't yeah. know, you know. We want to, we want to talk about stuff that stuff that's, gets us. Stuff that's interesting. Yeah, you know? something that elicits yeah. an emotional response. Yeah. yeah, very cool. But I'd love to know what you all think too. If you've noticed anything that, you know, either you've observed in different, you know, social channels or whatever that has come out that like really surprised you in terms of how popular it was or unpopular or whatever. Um, or if there's any feedback you always get, like you love some particular pen or something like that and everybody always dogs you for it because, you know, of whatever reason. I'm curious. All right, Drew, I have a question for you. Okay. From Akil. Is it worth it to try to repair your nibs yourself said another way is it worth it to try to repair nibs yourself um 
not so sure about that. Well, I, 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 I am sure of if it's worth it to learn to repair your nibs yourself. Mm. That I will say, um, based on whether or not you actually know how to do it, will determine whether or not it's worth it to try. If, mm. you, if you are just saying like, should I just give it a shot? No. Um, unless it's you just want to wing it. No, just not learn, unless it's, uh, learn it, as you go. If it's a super cheap nib, or if you are basically just going to throw it away or, or replace it. If you are either mm. saying like this thing is just borked and useless and it's going to go in the garbage, mm. or I need to buy a new nib for it. Like, great, buy a new nib for it. But before you do, sure, go to town on you the got nib. Nothing to lose. Yeah, you've got yeah. nothing to lose. So if you're in a nothing to lose scenario, absolutely, you should give it a try. Like that's the how that's how most people learn. Mm. More often than not, someone who is a nib specialist or a nib repair professional in any sort. Uh, was not taught 100% of their craft by someone else. They might have had people very few, who, very few. they might have had some people kind of like give them tips and suggestions, but mostly they're all self-taught and they're self-taught by just giving it a shot over and over and over again and learning, you know, just through time and experience. Mm -hmm. So yes, absolutely worth it to learn. And at its core, a nib is very, very simple. It's a piece of metal with, you know, a slit in it um, and, you know, a, some sort of tipping at the end usually uh so it's just a piece of metal so you really just take your fingers and move up and down two pieces of metal now that is simple and that is really the gist of the repair um or tuning process but the tolerances that it has you know the, mm. the difference between something that's scratchy and unbearable and something that's silky smooth and perfect is so so tiny mm. it can be frustrating and your motions need to be so 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 subtle sometimes mm. but then again gold is different than steel so you're going to get the feel of what to do here versus there nib shapes play a different role as well whether or not you can get it off the feed plays a role but really ultimately it comes down to experience mm. and the opportunities that you give yourself to give yourself that experience but i would say definitely if you are in a position to give yourself that experience do do that mm. i think it's kind of like cooking like i can cook okay but i'm not like a chef like i like you can give me a recipe and give me ingredients and i can make the meal but there's other people that i know who just like understand what is happening and understand mm -hmm all these nuances of the food and stuff like that, where they can make a meal that I literally couldn't make if you even told me step-by-step step how to do it. Yeah, I think that's you the know? difference between, you know, being able to kind of like, oh no, I've been presented with a variable that is not in these step-by-step -step right. instructions. I'm now I'm now lost and can't do anything. Whereas somebody yeah. who is experienced enough is gonna be say, oh, well, I don't have that. Let me sub in this or mm -hmm. something like that. Yeah. The difference think, between understanding. And yeah. Or like I, I, I'm fine doing some maintenance work like on my vehicle. You know, I can change an alternator and a battery. I can, you know, do, you know, my own tire rotation even if I need to. But like, I'm not going to do my own brake work. You know, it's like to me, I'm like, yeah, I don't really know enough. And even if I research it enough, I, it's got special tools that are needed. It requires some expertise and the stakes are kind of high if I do it wrong. So it, to me, it kind of falls into that category where it's like- I would never want to do my own breaks. I've, yeah, I've, like, I've, I've, I know I've, people that do and it's not, in I've theory, it's not, it's not that complicated, but it's a lot of work and it just takes a lot of time to really understand what you're also, doing. Also, if you don't do it right- Yeah, if you don't want to do it right, ugh. you can have consequences. It's to me that like nib work kind of feels like in a similar vein. Yeah. You know, so it's like, yeah, okay, if you already have- I don't know, say you have like a farm vehicle and it's like, you're not driving it on the road. Yeah, sure. Fix your own brakes. Why Try, not? who cares? Well, you know, whatever. There's, a, there's a tree somewhere you can run into. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but it's like, if you're, this is like your family car and something like that, and you have not really done it ever. I'm like, mm, yeah, maybe yeah, that's kind of thing. So I, I, I support what you're saying. I think it's great to learn. And I think it's great to learn how to adjust your nibs and like tune them, stuff like that. Just like if you're playing a musical instrument, you know, a good musician, will know how to like fine tune their instruments so that it plays, you know, to its best. But they're not necessarily gonna know how to like repair and build and fix the instrument. Yeah. Just as a musician. Like you usually would take it to somebody that specializes 
in repair and fixing and stuff like that. So I think the instrument, you know, in fountain pens, you know, I consider them to be writing That's instruments. That's a good analogy. Yeah, yeah. So it's like I'm a musician in many ways and, you know, but even like if you play piano, you're probably not even going to tune your own piano. You're going to have somebody that like does that specially. So I think it comes down to how complex of your nib that it is. I will say that it's it's easier to play around with steel nibs than it is with gold nibs. If, if, if that sounds weird or not, you know, gold nibs are usually more expensive. So I think people are more hesitant, but you would think like, oh, gold is like softer. So it might be easier to, you know, to bend or fix or whatever, but it's actually the opposite because gold is less, you know, it's less for, forgiving, you know, it's like, you have to, you have to basically like overdo all of your movements with gold. And then it kind of springs back a little bit, whereas steel kind of goes more where you put it. And it's a little more forgiving in terms of you flexing it up and back and you know all that kind of stuff so i mean i know with any nib stuff that we've ever done they always say like start out with steel nibs of course especially because you're going to screw it up a yeah. lot and then you just you know you want to screw up a bunch of steel nibs and not gold nibs so um yeah but it's, it's interesting you know i wouldn't i wouldn't discourage anybody from trying but definitely make sure that you're like you know being conscious that you're you're going to screw it up and just don't do it on anything that you wouldn't be willing to throw away but most nib people can fix pretty much anything too. So even if you screw it up pretty bad, nib people are pretty good. All right, cool. Okay, next, next question is from Garrett. And Garrett says, it looks like the newest marketing trick of limited editions has mm. found its way into the fountain pen world as well. What's the goal of this? Mm. Limited availability of materials and or resources? Push up the price of a given product? Tickle the collectors to keep on buying their stuff? FOMO, make the customer feel somewhat special since he's about to acquire a rare, thus valuable thing or other. Um, yeah, kind of all of the above, yeah. I guess, <laughs> potentially. I mean, <clears throat> uh, I was a little, you know, I, I thought this was very interesting, Garrett, because I, in my observation, this isn't a new thing no, in the God. fountain pen world. Like, no. uh, we've had limited editions since I can remember, you know, I don't yeah. know. If, I don't know if objectively there are more of them or less of them. I would say there's definitely less of an emphasis on limited editions as like an investment now than there were when we first got yeah. into the business. I mean, Pilot's been doing their annual limited editions before, before you started we retailing. Yeah, yeah. Mommy was doing special editions every year and all that kind yeah, of stuff. So before like, us. So yeah, I mean, those two, the probably the most annually mm -hmm. well-known ones predate our company for yeah, sure. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of special editions. When I think limited editions, I think like numbered, you know, so many out of so many, like they're truly limited in quantity. They're only making like the it out of that material or a theme or whatever, and that's it, and that's all that's going to be available. Yeah, the pilots would fall into that, like the vanishing points would fall into that category. But not the Lamis. Not the Lamis. Those are more like a special color, and they make a bunch of them, but yeah. it's not around forever, you know. Um, so it depends on where you draw that line and call something, you know, limited edition. I think gener there's no there's no like word police in the fountain pen world, but I think generally speaking, limited edition means numbered. And numbered. That's the way we see it. Numbered but out of a certain quantity. You could just say that they're but, limited yeah. in some sure. way. Sure. Some limited, limited in whatever capacity yeah. you want to define. Um, I don't think it's anything new. I think, especially in the fountain pen world, from what I understand, because we haven't been in this industry forever, uh, it was something that became more popularized in like the 90s and early 2000s. Um, specifically, I think Mont Blanc came up with a whole bunch of limited editions um, for like collectors, you know, collectible you know, pens. And I know that, that when uh, Giuseppe Aquila, you know, took yeah. over Monte Grappa, that's when he started mm -hmm. with his dragon pen and they just kind of yeah. went from there. Exactly, exactly. So I think that there are definitely were like, were some of the higher end brands that started doing limited editions more um, around that time. So I don't have a lot of perspective on that other than kind of what have been told by people who've been in the industry longer. Um, but you know, I can definitely speak to some of the points that you, that you did here. So as in terms of like why they're made, um, it's a lot of the reasons you kind of mentioned just like mashed together for, or, or maybe like a few of them. Um, my experience has been that it's, it's generally not a, what you called it a marketing trick. You know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily call it a trick because I think that in, that implies deceit or trying to like get more money out of somebody just for the sake of getting more money out of somebody. Um, I, that may or may not be the case at various levels with various things. Yeah. But, I mean, it's, you know, it, I mean, I don't want to be naive. Like I'm sure somebody has done it at some point, but it's, yeah, but I don't think that's, that's not the overwhelming, no, like motivator, not that, not that what in we've the seen pen world. Yeah. Um, so my experience has been that it's not, not just a money grab. Um, even though limited edition pens are 
sometimes you know more expensive than similar versions of the pen yeah um if a pen's usually if a pen's in a similar material and just a different color we find that they're often similar in price or close yeah. enough to where it's pretty justifiable um you know with you know whatever within five percent increase or something like that like thinking about like the special edition safaris and all stars and stuff they're usually the exact same price um but there's nuances to that um I think for for limited editions, having been in this industry a little while now and knowing a lot of folks who've been in the industry for decades or maybe generations, uh, honestly, they're just like making the same stuff every day all the time. And sometimes they just need something to keep their interest and to keep them as manufacturers like motivated and excited. So I see a lot of that. They're just like, OK, we got to we got to do something fresh. We got it. You know, they get kind of restless and they just want to you know, creatively put, put something into a new product. Um, so I think that they, when they do that, they sometimes will make something that's, you know, maybe more risky, more speculative, something more quirky, you know, and then it may flop, you know, and then they're kind of stuck with it. So there's an element of risk, which, you know, from a whatever financial standpoint, you would say the bigger risk they take, you know, maybe they should be financially rewarded for that. Because if you even it out over a bunch of different pens, some are going to flop, some are going to do great. You know, so they they you should be rewarded for that. But um, I think a lot of brands like to do special editions, limited editions, things like that, because it keeps the brand in people's minds. You know, like thinking of like Lamy. If Lamy yeah. never came out with new colors, you'd have your safaris and stuff like that, and it would just be stale. And you'd be like, okay, yeah, these are cool pens, but like, yeah, they don't come out what, with regular you know, editions. Yeah, like hardly ever. Yeah, it's kind of like a sequel to a movie in a franchise. Yeah, so you, you know, it's like there's it gives a breath of new life to the whole yeah. franchise, right? Or or you know, a theme park that comes out with a new ride, you know, gives you a reason to go back to the park and experience the whole thing all over again. You know, this is a pattern of anything. Um, I think that that these limited edition type things serve that purpose. Even if you don't end up buying whatever the limited edition thing is, like the bond pen with Monograppa, for example. Very few people are actually going to buy that pen, but it's still cool to see what that pen is and does, and it gets you thinking and talking and all that kind of stuff. So it's cool even just as an observer. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah. Um, so I think that uh, you know a lot of times the the costs for the products themselves are actually higher from the manufacturing to distribution all the way down, um, especially if it's a unique material or if there's you know a special model that requires more R and D. You know, going back to the bond pen again, that like bullet filling system thing, they had to develop all that. I'm sure there was tons of failed prototypes they had built in there, lots of time. Yeah, lots none of, of that already stuff. existed anywhere. Yeah. There's uh, yeah. Also, it might just be a result of them having to produce fewer of them. Oh, for sure. Yeah. So, so like, if yeah, they, I mean, you know, they make their money back on quantity a lot of the times. Well, there's, so. yeah. So, like, there's, you know, if you've got any any type of business, like, cognizance, you know, about you, you know, there's, like, fixed costs involved and there's variable costs. Variable costs are, like, the cost of the material, the cost of, you know, shipping each pen and that kind of a thing that will float up and down depending on how many pens you have. But there's fixed costs, like your research and development, like any licensing fees that you may have with a particular franchise. Oh, yeah. You know, you might have, um, you know... Uh, paying for UPCs and trademark registration and like all these behind the scenes boring business stuff that we don't want to think about as enthusiasts, but, you know, is absolutely a part of making business happen. Um, all of these things are fixed costs and the fewer pens you have, you have fewer products to spread all those fixed cost costs out, you know. And and so you have to uh, you have to raise the price sometimes yeah. just for that reason alone, um, because they don't want to lose money on a new product like that. Um, and then let's see here the materials themselves. If you get into things like celluloid, sterling silver, special plating, special nibs, unique yeah. packaging, and special boxes and stuff like that, that all costs a lot more. Um, and so that gets built in sometimes. Um, I mentioned the licensing fees things. I mean, I remember. It's no joke. Yeah. So back way back in Goulet pens history days, before we ever sold fountain pens. So when they were, when you were making Goulet I pens. Was, I was making, hand making wood pens, rollerball pens. Um, and fountain pens were not even on my radar. Uh, we actually licensed pens to our alma mater. Virginia Tech. Right. And I became familiar with the licensing process. You did uh, um, wine stoppers too, didn't we you? We did wine with bottle stoppers VT that had the, the VT yeah, logo. Yeah, I remember so we those. Engraved and we had, yeah, we had wood pens that had the official you had like, school logo you had like, and all that. Didn't you have like a wood that kind of was like maroony orange? So yeah, we ended up doing some of that. Yeah, we, so we made what? some acrylic pens and then we made some that were out of, you know, 
some woods that were a little more in that like yeah. color scheme. Yeah. Like it were freaking nice stuff, man. Yeah. Nobody bought them, but mm. you know. Um, but you still had to pay for licensing. Well, we had special insurance that we had to buy just to protect the trademark of the school. I think I, my numbers may be a little bit off here, but I think it was $1,700 a year just for the insurance for the trademark. For the school, it didn't cover us of anything. It was protection for the school. And then um, we had to pay them, I, I wanna say it was like 17% of the total retail price we had to pay to the school for licensing, which I think is somewhat standard. I don't think that's like So you didn't have to pay crazy. anything outright? Other than, um, other than the insurance? We probably, ha I think we had to pay like a $500, $1,000 like okay. fee up front to do to for the application process That's or something that like crazy. that. Yeah, so I mean, any, I mean, if you're, if you're familiar with any, especially like college franchise or sports franchise, like you buy a lamp or a t-shirt or anything that has like an NFL or NBA or whatever logo on it, you know you're paying a lot more for that product because it's that like official logo thing uh, because of licensing fees. So um, not all fountain pens are licensed. In fact, many aren't, but there are some. And, aren't. and sometimes you see those and you're like, oh, okay. You know that that costs a lot more to do those licensing fees. And so that is a, a factor as well. Um, so, you know, I think the, the maybe the tone, I, I inferred the tone of the questions to be maybe a bit cynical, you know, just I in terms of like, fair. you know, a bit guarded and stuff like that, which is, I think, legit, because I think I think that in most industries, it's it probably seems like more of a money grab. In my experience, most of the extra costs of limited edition pens has been somewhat justifiable, um, especially, you know, if it's ones that we carry, we usually we, we don't keep an eye on all limited editions with all brands. But usually if we pick it up and it seems like an astronomically just disconnected price from what makes sense in the fountain pen world, we won't we won't even bother picking it up. Um, we at least have to kind of be able to justify ourselves as retailers to get on board with it. But, um, you know, there's lots of good reasons why something might cost a little bit more. But at the end of the day, it's honestly just up to you whether you feel it's worth it or not. Um, because these limited edition things, I would say, don't don't buy them for a speculation of flipping or an investment or anything like that. Just if you enjoy it and you get value out of it, whatever price it is, then that's a fair price. And that's really what you should be thinking about. You know what is just a BS cash grab? What's that? When you get food that says collector's edition packaging on it. Oh. Like, come on. Am I really going to like, oh, I got to buy these Doritos because it's like, like. Like the Rachel gets this like spring mix or whatever, Starbucks K-Cups. And, that, and that's fine. They're like, they're literally called limited edition. Right. Like, come on. Spring, you know, like, oh, blend look, or whatever it it's, is. It's, you know, uh, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, insert famous person here, tricks cereal, like collector's mm. edition. Like what, who who collects boxes of cereal? I, somebody does. I know somebody does, but come on, collector's edition. Does. Oh, look, Cheetos with the Fortnite collector's edition bag. Nah, come on. You know, collector's I, edition Cheeto bag, Fortnite. The only, the only collectible thing I really have from when I was a kid is I went to, there was like, I guess it's, it was called a, it was called Dixie Trading Post. But it was basically like sort. It wasn't. A, it was like a not a pawn shop, but like a of that vibe, you know, like a collector's yeah shop. Do you remember this? It was like in our local area or whatever. Was um, it? Over, but they had they had was old, it Virginia Center. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you remember that? They had like old school Star Wars toys. They had there. old toys and yeah. stuff like that. So I remember seeing. Wow. I remember seeing like super old like Matchbox cars and stuff like that. And I was really into whatever exotic cars when I was a kid for whatever reason. So I remember going in there and seeing like old cars in there, and they were like. Four dollars a piece when at the time they were selling for maybe like fifty cents a piece yeah. or something like it, or a dollar a piece or something. And I was like, "Oh, I should like collect these because that's going to be worth a lot of money someday." Not realizing mm -hmm. at all how any of that worked. So for a while there, I was buying duplicates of all of my Matchbox cars of the cars that I liked, and I kept one in the package, and then I played with one. And I have probably, I don't know, 40 or 50 different cars. I only bought like you gen still have genuine them in cars. The, in the uh, they're in my attic or something. They're probably, the packaging is probably destroyed because yeah. I haven't stored them properly. But I should pull those out one day. I, I literally have not opened up that box probably in 20 years. Wow. So I should pull it out one day. I I can almost guarantee you I've got a Ferrari F50 in there, probably a McLaren F1, probably a Ferrari Testarossa. 
you know, Lamborghini Countach, like all the stereotypical like 80s and 90s yeah. like, supercars. I probably got all of those in like a Matchbox or Hot Wheels form. I remember walking into that store one time and I saw an old Star Wars toy from the 70s and it said $4 on it. And I'm like, <gasps> and I picked it up it and, it and, so and walked it over to the table and I put it down. I was all excited. like, <laughs> And he's like, do you know how much this is? I was like, yeah, $4. He's like, no, this is $89.99. Because they just left the original price on there from the oh. 70s because they don't want to they don't want to stick anything new on it. Oh, wow. And I just sadly walked back and put it oh, back. I was so Drew. excited. I know. Little kid Drew. I know. Oh. I remember what it was. It was. I know. Maybe it wasn't. I remember seeing the little blaster pistol that the scout troopers on the little bikes used. Oh, yeah. Because yeah. they, they didn't make a, a modern like 90s version of that little gun. Oh, yeah. And I wanted it so bad. Hmm. But uh Yeah. Shame, and of course, those back in, back in those days, the gun was just all flat black, no right. orange, no orange or white color. Yeah. They just they just look like a legit little pistol. Yeah, it's just a plastic mold, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, so cool. funny, so funny. Anyway, a bit of a tangent there, but yeah, there you go. So anyway, whatever, buy it if you like it. <laughs> all right. Uh, next question. This is from R. Tyler James. Says, was there ever an ink that you didn't like at first, but it definitely grew on you? Mm. Mm. Yes. Yes, it, yeah. there was. Yeah. Um, you got see. a few. You got a few yeah. here. You got a list. Well, I've got I've got a couple. Yeah. So overall, I will say that there were two escapades that I took myself on mm. that many of you were right along with me. I went on a pink escapade where I decided I'm going to find a pink ink that I really like. And I just wrote with a bunch of different pinks. And I did that because I never reach for pinks. I never because I'd never really tried them. So I was not a fan of pinks, but I thought, you know what? I'm the type of person that Whatever I'm using at the time is kind of my favorite thing. So maybe I'll just use them and see what happens. Sure enough, Hope Pink by Diamine, I fell in love with. I thought it was a great, super vibrant, kick you in the teeth pink. And I love it now. So hooray for that. I did the same thing with yellows. I went two weeks using nothing but yellows in my fountain mm. pens, tried a bunch of different ones. Ultimately, I did discover Ferris Wheel Press Buttered Popcorn. That became my favorite. However, we didn't sell it at the time, so I didn't want to talk about it here on the Pencast. So I settled on um, Roarer and Klingner Helianthus, which is also oh, yeah. quite excellent. Hmm. Um, so that was like my official favorite, but I just decided to bother Brian and Rachel for a long time until they said, okay, you fine, then we can carry buttered popcorn. So yellows and pinks, yes, did not like them at first. Now I have at least one in both color categories that I absolutely love. Mm. And then there were the kind of dusty pinky purples. Like uh, when I first started out, I wanted nothing but heavy saturation. Oh yeah. I wanted just oh, yeah. bright, vibrant colors that just popped off the paper. And I've transitioned pretty away from that. I still have a few staples, but yeah. um, I like more toned down colors these days. And mm. one of the shades that I've really fallen in love with is kind of the subdued purpley pinky uh, area. And Robert Auster really does a great job with those colors. Mm. They have um, Thunderstorm, which is a little darker, um, but more in the unsaturated zone uh, lies Cherry Blossom, okay. which is the lightest pink that I really, really enjoy. Any okay. lighter than that, I'm kind of, nice. it doesn't count because it's too light to see, mm. but I love Cherry Blossom. It has great shading. I think it's a super duper ink. And then they've got Violet Clouds and, um, uh, oh, what's the other one? Violet Clouds and Violet Dreams. Okay, so same mm -hmm. ink, essentially one with silver shimmer, one with gold shimmer. I love those two inks. They're a lot of fun to write with. They have sheen shimmer, and uh, I think they're just dark enough in spots so you can see them just fine, but they're light enough so you get a lot of fun shading. And then, um, yeah, that's pretty much it. Okay. I, I'll try anything and eventually I'll be into it. I think the only, um, I remember the first thing I, the first time I stepped out into like a zone I didn't already love were, were grays. When yeah, I first yeah. uh, wrote with, like, I think it was Noodler's Lexington Gray that first got me into it. And then I tried mm. Dye Mine Graphite and yeah. loved Graphite. And then I tried Earl Gray, loved that. Tried Dye Mine uh, Silver Fox, I think. Um, and that I really loved. So. Mm. Then I realized, you know what, Drew? There are there's a world out there that's not just 
heavy duty saturation. Yeah, I would say I experienced something similar. Like I, like many of you, um, had somewhat of a conversion experience when I got into fountain pens. And what I found most appealing about fountain pens and ink specifically was like properties and colors that you can't get in a rollerball pen. Yeah. So I was like, forget, you know, we're just regular blues, blacks, you know, flat plain colors. I want really intense colors. I want, you know, broad nibs, shading, sheening, shimmer, whatever. I was like, I want stuff that you can't get out of any other pen than a fountain pen. Um, I still am fired up by that kind of stuff. But, you know, I think I could speak broadly to like most, I don't know, call them general characteristics of pens that are similar to what you could get in a rollerball. Um, I steered away from those for quite a long time. And then I kind of came back to them. I was like, no, there actually are a really good, you know, number of grays, for example, like diamond graphite for me um, and Lexington gray. I had kind of the reverse. I used graphite first. Um, and part of that was we just got diamond first, mm -hmm. you know, in our company. And I experienced that and I was like, oh, like I was, I was impressed because of how much it looked like graphite pencil on the page. And I was like, oh, this is actually really cool. Cause I get a smoother, better writing experience, but it still kind of looks, you know, like pencil. And, you know, I, so I, I kind of went away and then I kind of came back to like, no, it's okay if it, if it can like overlap in some of its characteristics of other writing instruments, but I still get all the enjoyment of a fountain pen. So graphite for that was me. And then the, what I really like about Lexington gray is the, the waterproofness of it. So graphite is probably one of my favorite grays, but then Lexington is up there as well. I like Lexington. It's just fe it just feathers a little bit too much for me. It can. It depends on what it's in and what yeah. paper and stuff like that. Um, any any permanent ink, you know, is going to yeah. have a tendency to do that. A I just bit. don't. I don't need that, so I I, I shifted away from that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, I had, and then Earl Grey yeah. is super popular too, but I don't really ever use that. I, I should I probably really use that one much. Everybody yeah. loves Earl Grey, and I just haven't hmm. I haven't inked it up. All right, well, I bet if you ink it up, you'll probably like it. That's and what I you'll do. you'll probably talk about it too much, and then we'll probably set all it out. So um, I guess, folks, go ahead and get it now before Drew uses it because we're going to run oh, I can't make Earl Grey um, any more popular than it is. <laughs> that thing's already... It's, it's, it's yeah, yeah, it's good. Um, I had, uh, so I had a couple different ones. I would say, um, like you, I liked really intense inks. Uh, and I really liked intense saturated colors like bold colors but also i really like shading which sometimes the two can be in conflict with one another um, which is why probably you, you like compecky so much of course because yeah. that was I mean, bold any, with a little shade yeah and there's an and that's and there's a number of noodlers colors that can do that that can achieve both and there's you know there have been a number of, of ones because usually the less saturated color is the more of a tendency it has to shade especially if you're using a really wet pen right um but there are some good ones that have a little bit of both um but some of the ones that i kind of steered away from at first were some of like the what i would call like dusty colors they're yeah. like more like the pale colors um yeah. urban poussière de lune is one it's like a dusty purple yeah it's got really got no like outstanding properties to it, nothing crazy, but it's just, it's such a pleasing color to me. And it's really like the first color that I kind of fell in love with that was like, oh, I never, never would have like picked this color out of a lineup and said, I'm gonna love this color. But just after using it a few times and just appreciating the nuances um, of how the ink performs on paper, I really fell in love with it. And it's just that love has continued. Um, and then kind of in that vein is like um, like golden browns. Uh, oh, yeah. You know, like a lot of golden browns. There's a number of them. And some of them can get like really like yellow and kind of punchy. Yeah, it's the sepia tones um, tend to kind of skirt that line too. Yeah, they walk that line. And, um, but uh, Urban Lee de Tay. So it's, it's more subtle. It's more on the brown side, not as much like an intense yellow. Um, but it kind of looks like if you were to take like tea and ink it up in your pen and write with it, that's kind of what it looks like. And I really fell in love with that, especially writing on it with ivory paper. So if you're using ivory paper with Lita Tay, it just looks like something written in like the 1800s. It has this like very kind of antique -y kind of look to it, which I fell in love with right away. And there's a number of golden brown colors. I don't use golden browns all that much, but it was another kind of color that I was like, oh, I wouldn't probably have thought that I would have loved this so much, but I really came to enjoy them. Um, and then the one other one that I had that was really kind of out there, something I didn't anticipate was like olive greens. Oh yeah. Like specifically Alt Goldgrün from Roy and Klingner. And that is like, it was such a sleeper of a shader. Um, it is just one of the most intensely shading colors I've ever seen. 
Sorry, I was looking up this thing. So I had uh, okay. Jeremy, our data analyst. Uh -huh. um, uh -huh. I'm gonna do. I'm gonna. I'm working on an upcoming video that is based on popular inks, perhaps. Okay. 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 Lee Detay, most popular Urban ink. Get out of here. Yep. What? Yep. Overall. Uh, I think I had him run the report for the last six months. Get out of here. I know, right? It surprised me too. Uh, Posterior de Lune was number uh, was was the second, but um, yeah, Lee Detay, man. Get out. I, th I thought that More was More than like Pearl Noir or yeah. Eclat? The I, well, I told him to give me the top two of every brand. Huh. Right? Because Pearl Noir was up there as so this, like this number is, one for this a long time. This um, is samples. Okay. Um, samples. So because Rachel told me that um, bottles are somewhat more skewed. Bottles because, are tough because there's different sizes. Well, there's them. different si sizes. And if you're in stock issues, affect bottles more than they do samples. That's true. Because you That's can be true. out of stock in bottles, but you can still have some samples left. Yeah. And then you can get a restock and then mm -hmm. it's okay. So she said that. Yeah, we can ride out the, the, the sellouts. Right. So she samples, said that that yeah. was a better representation of what's popular. Interesting. Oh, I'd be really fascinated to know because, like, I know Pearl Noir for many years was, you know, among the most popular colors. Well, I mean, I can look up, but, but he gave me but, bottles um, too. Um, oh yeah, oh, yeah, I'd be interested. Let's see. I mean, m most of the time, the black ink and whatever brand is going to be among its most popular. Yeah. So in bottles, uh, yeah, in bottles, Pearl Noir was more popular. But I think we have two sizes there? of that. I think we do. I think we have the I larger. Make, I know we've. I'm kind of curious. Got to give it the goog. But you know, uh, second to that, um, Pursa de Lune and Rouge Granat is, or Granat, um, is, are up there. So I don't know. I can't trust bottles, but. Interesting. Anyway, I just thought that yeah, it was. we do have two different sizes of bottles. Yeah, so that, that's kind of, that's why you can't trust bottles. That's a little bottles. tougher. That's a little yeah. tougher. But so, tougher. so with. Um, the sample wise. So yeah, overall. Lee Detay is the Lee most popular bond? Yeah. Now is that is do they count sixteen seventy and the seventeen ninety eight? Is that because that's Jacques Urban? Um, it depends. See, this is like where it gets so tough for mm. us to answer these types of questions. Is like there's all these nuances of how we pull certain data and like how we choose. No, to it does not things. include Jacques. Jacques is okay. Jacques is different because I like Emerald de Chafour has got to be. It's got to beat the pants I off bet Lee de Tay. I bet you can't guess the uh, second best one. The second best uh, Jacques Urban. Jacques Urban. You're not. You're not going to. You're not going to get to. Carub de sheep. No. Vert Atlantide. Okay, it's like a nice teal color. Over over rouge hematite. No, though? Vert Atlantide is like a. It's like a pure like a olive green, isn't it? Over rouge hematite. Like what? That is interesting. Right. But Emerald de Chavour, like Yeah, Vert Atlantide is the. I mean, that's newer, so that kind of makes sense. Like. Lot, like Still, I was, a I lot like a lot of people know what that is yeah that is interesting I was but no huh. Shavor beat the pants off of all of them like it's not even oh yeah it doesn't even oh yeah count Shavor is probably like among the top like it is three of all ink samples yeah. it's got to be so anyway um stay tuned i would you know if you yeah. want to know more about best-selling so inks, interesting. So hang, interesting hang around for a bit yeah there you go all right well we're curious to know y'all too since we've you know been answering this question for a little bit but let us know in the comments what um some of your inks that you weren't as crazy about but that grew on you over time all right drew <gasps> okay um, we're going to finally answer a question from our friend Caroline, and mm -hmm. this is an oldie from 2019. Ooh, but again, classic. I believe this is the Caroline that I'm thinking of. She still contributes. So hooray for long-term pen All friends. Right. It will pay off eventually, maybe. There you go. Just hang in there. Uh, <laughs> Caroline asks, oh, this is not a pen question, but I've always wondered about it. What did Brian and Rachel major in at Virginia Tech, and how did it feed into what they're doing now? Mm. Having a kid in college and having once been a kid in college who majored in something that I loved but didn't end up using directly, I have a curiosity about this topic. Ooh, good, good question. Um, we've talked about this fairly openly before, but it's probably been a while, um, honestly. It's Actually, no, it's just been, been a week. Um... <laughs> 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 but y'all didn't hear any of that. Hey. Um, yeah, so... I don't remember it anyway, so tell me again. Yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously, Rachel and I talked a lot more about our college experience early on in this business when yeah. that's all we had. Was right college, time at nine. College experience, yeah. Our right time on Tuesday at 2.22 was the first version of that because... 2.22 a.m.? No, p.m. Oh, I was about to yeah. say, who is going to be up then? Okay. No, 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 no. I mean, I was up. Yeah, y'all were still up. all hours in the Loonies. Night. Yes. Um, yeah, but anyway. Okay, so... Uh, uh, it's Virginia a long, Tech. it's a long story and I'm not even going to try and hide that it's going to be a long story. Just buckle up because last time we said this last week, 
<laughs> I was like, I'm gonna try and make this brief and I totally didn't at all. So yep, yeah, Drew, you should go never, refill you should your coffee. never say you're gonna try to be brief. I, I have never accomplished that uh, when I've practiced not on, it. Not on your own. Not on my own, no. Rachel's gotta cut me off. Or Jen or somebody. Or somebody. Yeah. Um, so it is a long story, buckle up. And uh, so Rachel started out at another school. She was actually a music major. Um, her and I were both musicians growing up. She loved music. Um, went in as a music major, also loved computer science. So she went in sort of as a double major of both music and computer science, which she might have been the only person at her school that was that, that at the time. Um, but it was a small school that she she went to at first. Um, she was there for a semester, wasn't the right fit for her. Um, and she just decided basically she loved music, but as a career, she couldn't just really make sense of it. Um, it's tough. It's a tough gig uh, to do. So um, she actually ended up, she went to community college for the second half of her freshman year just to, you know, knock out a bunch of core curriculum stuff, save a bunch of money. And then she transferred uh, to where we both ended up graduating, which was Virginia Tech. So state school. Um, out in the mountains, in Southwest the Virginia. Beautiful mountains of Southwest Virginia, up in Appalachia. And uh, so I went there from the get because I wanted to do the Corps of Cadets, the military program there. Um, and I did not really know what I wanted to do as my major. I don't think you were alone there. Yeah, I think it's a lot of students. They actually have a major there that's basically for people that don't know what they want to do. It is called... Lazy Bones. It's called University Studies. Oh, there we go. Which sounds made up, but it was actually my major for my freshman year. Um, I thought I was going to be an engineer because I liked math. I was good at cool. it. I love building stuff. Um, but I... I didn't realize just how hard that was and that it's like you got to go into it and it's basically a five-year program. Like you really can't even graduate in four years as an engineer pretty much because like the course load is so heavy. Like you could theoretically do it in four years, but you got to take like 18 to 20 credits every semester. It's just grueling and it's hard classes um, plus lab time and all this stuff. So it's very difficult. I don't especially, like that. especially in the core. There's a lot of cadets that did engineering because they wanted to be like pilots or whatever. So like they would do aerospace engineering or architecture or something like that. Oh, it makes me tired just thinking was, about it. You, 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 you will not know anybody that works any harder than a cadet who is also doing engineering. It's ridiculous. Um, so anyway, uh, I thought I was going to do engineering, and that lasted for one class. I didn't even. I wasn't even in the engineering program. I was going intending to maybe transfer into it because it's a it's a it's an there's a big engineering program at virginia tech um so i was thinking like oh maybe i'll try it and i so i took my core curriculum classes or i signed up for ones that were like just the core curriculum classes that engineers had to take because basically it's sort of like any other like medical program or like law program or anything like that they just want to weed out like probably a third of the class like freshman year so they just just beat you up and just abuse you with books and tests and all that kind of stuff just to weed out the people that don't have what it takes. And I was absolutely in that category. I was, I was going to ask. Okay. <laughs> so the first class I went to was just an English class that was the English class that's required for engineers. Because my thought was, I'm going to take, you know, and I like had a counselor or whatever. I was, I, somebody was coaching me on that, but they were like, take the core curriculum classes for the engineering program so that if you transfer in, you're not behind, right? English can't be too scary, right? Oh, yeah. So I show up and they give us the syllabus. And of course, I'm coming from like, you know, high school, whatever. And I've just gone through the basic training with the cadets. So I've just already been, you know, my head was shaved. I'm in uniform. I have no personal identity whatsoever. I'm just a cog in a machine, <laughs> you know, as part of this. So I just finished all that getting beat up in the by basic training. And I go to my first class and there's like a hundred people in the class. And I'm just like, what's happening? And they're like, yep, here's a syllabus. Your first test is in six weeks and you have to read these like 10 books by the time that happens. And, you know, good luck. And it was just like, I am not going to be able to do this. Like if I can't even handle the like core curriculum English class <laughs> that's required for engineers, like this is in the program for me. So I very quickly pivoted out of that and I was like, I gotta find something else. Um, but they were a pretty solid business program and I was somewhat entrepreneurial in nature. So I was like, okay, business probably seems like more of the avenue that I could actually do. Business. So um, I still was university studies though, and you can't just like transfer in. So, cause it's like, they have the whole university. I mean, Virginia Tech is big. There's like 30,000 undergraduates oh, yeah. or something. Massive. Big school. Um, so you, to get into the college of business, I had to take a bunch of business 
like core curriculum classes and apply into the business program to even to be a business major. So I went my whole freshman year taking business classes, not knowing if I would get into the program or not. Thankfully I did. So then my major was business management uh, with a, a concentration of entrepreneurship, which seems apt right now, looking back. Um, ironically enough, <laughs> I transferred out of that. Um, basically like it was, it's kind of geared a little more towards corporate business even the entrepreneurship track, it still was fairly corporate um, and uh, was not quite what I was looking for. But then I found a program that was actually started at Virginia Tech. And it was one of two programs in the country at that time that was for residential property management. Um, that was for like managing apartments and real estate and stuff like that. Um, and because of the way that it was founded at the school, it wasn't technically in the business program. It was in the whatever I have like a, I have a bachelor of arts, not a bachelor of science technically, um, cause it was in that side of the school. But, um, yeah, so I, I ended up transferring into that halfway through my junior year. So I technically changed col like changed college programs within the school, like twice during my time there, I had to take extra summer school classes and everything. And I had to do an internship technically after I graduated to complete my credits because of all the late transfers and stuff. So I did a lot of extra school just because I didn't have things figured out. Oh. Um, but I still, I technically graduated six weeks after graduation happened. Whatever. Extra in school just <laughs> oh, triggers yeah, something like, in my brain. I took community college classes over a couple of different winter and summer breaks, oh. you know, to make up for things, you know, cause it's just, you know, it, it was hard. And I was in the core, which, it was a lot of extra time. So I just, I could only take so many credits. Um, but anyway, so it all worked out. Ironically enough, Rachel, when what, she, what, what, she, tran she transferred to Virginia did, did you say what your degree was in? Oh. Um, That's I'm, the question. The question is. I'm trying to remember. Well, it was in, <laughs> it was residential property management. So like basically I, I graduated, I was a certified apartment manager and I had my realtor's license um, because it was like basically real estate gotcha. stuff. So there was a lot of business stuff but i ultimately i ended up taking a lot of extra harder business classes than what would have been required had i just known i literally didn't know about the property management stuff because it was it was just not a widely known about program um but it was something i discovered late in my career and uh ended up changing so really glad i found it because it was a great program and actually it was it was a very entrepreneurial kind of scrappy startup-y type of program within the school so that vibe actually worked really well for me um and then Rachel, funny enough, she transferred to Virginia Tech, was not a music major. She was human development because she's, you know, she's got a heart for people. What is human you know, development? Human development is uh, cloning. No, I'm just kidding. Oh, okay. Uh, it's, it's, it is kind of a funny sounding major, but um, it's basically like the undergraduate program that a lot of people take who want to do social work. Ah. So, you know, that type of stuff. So you learn a lot oh. about family and counseling and, you know, you know, just human like childhood you know, programs and stuff like that. So it's like, if you want to get into maybe teaching or social work or anything like that. It seems like that would be kind of a lot for her. Um, she was good at it and was interested in it, but yeah, it was like very quickly, like Rachel's, she's like a super deep, like emotion person, but not like a broad, like widely. Like she, 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 can, she, she, she feels, have, she feels hard and deep for a, yes, you know, she feel. can have big feels. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's the kind of thing that like seeing where that was going to head in terms of like yeah. a career and basically like you don't, you don't, it's the kind of program like you don't graduate with that and do anything with it. You have to get your master's if you want to do anything in social work Ooh. and all that kind of stuff. So it's like really hard, really grueling, lots of extra school. She was kind of just like, yeah, I don't know. So she actually ended up transferring into the school of business mm. as I was transferring out. Really? So she sort of like took my spot, uh, um, you know, but she ended up keeping going, it warm for her. She went business management with an HR focus instead of the entrepreneurship focus, which actually is directly applied to a lot of what here because you know i ended up doing more of the scrappy startup -y kind of stuff with getting the, the pen thing off the ground and rachel was the one who had more of like the financial accounting and the hr cognizance and labor laws and like all that type of you know stuff that she remembered uh, from her classes and i remember so even in the, the garage when you had like one other dude in there you still had the hr posters hung up on yep. the on the exposed beams yep yep <laughs> so there was so that we, 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 knew, we knew we knew what was going on i'm not sure it was osha compliant at that point you know but I think it only applies when you have a certain number of people. Anyway, whatever. We have we have general cognizance around all that stuff. So I would say like there's nothing specifically about our college experience that applied towards fountain pens or e-commerce per se, but we definitely took some like basic finance classes and some HR classes and just, you know, uh, even just like understanding 
you know, business structures and, um, you know, certain, certain things about finances and accounting and that type of stuff. Um, you know, we didn't remember all the details of it, but we certainly knew enough to know what we needed to research more and when to apply certain things as we were starting the business. So I think there's, there's definitely things that we were able to apply and benefit from, though we both had a bit of a wandering path to get there. So I would say, don't worry too much about your own kid. They'll find their way. But, you know, it's definitely helpful if you just, even if you end up transferring and trying things and do it late, like just pursue something with vigor. That's kind of my best thing. Like Gusto. Yeah. What's, what was frustrating for me is seeing people that like were in school that like didn't really know what they wanted to do at all. So they just kind of did something. Yeah. And I guess it's better It's better than not having any clue what you're doing, but especially if you're taking on a whole bunch of debt and then I, you kind of graduate with like a philosophy degree yeah. and you don't really know. I'm like, oh, I don't really know how beneficial that is necessarily. But well, like, it, can, it, can, it can just- Nothing really, wrong with philosophy, by the way. No, but, it's but, just, but, you know, but going into debt without a good reason is no, yeah. never a good idea. Yeah, both Rachel and I were pretty much running like the cost benefit analysis on like our time and school costs and everything. And I mean, school costs have easily doubled, if not tripled since we were in school even. It's just uh, incredible. Um, but anyway, so yeah, it was very, very interesting experience. I don't regret it, but definitely is one that like, as we're talking to our kids, I'm kind of like, so how about that community college, you know, cause there's, do you really need to pay like 30 grand a year to have an undergraduate experience? Maybe not, I don't know. So we're talking about all that stuff with our kids. Though what I will say is pretty cool. Literally this morning as I was driving Joseph into school, he's taking an elective this, this semester, he's in seventh grade. He's taking an elective called make it your business. And I saw the, the and I was like, oh, that's kind of interesting. And I saw the, the curriculum for the class and it's all about like, structures of a company and profit and loss and like all the like wow all these like okay. very legitimate business concepts and so i was like oh dude like okay so i i kind of quizzed him this morning because he's been in it for like a month now so i was like so joseph like uh, how's that class going do you how's business do you remember anything that's happening in this class and he was like oh yeah right now we're learning about business structures mm. and i was like really i was like do you remember anything from the class he's like yeah we learned about sole proprietor and a partnership and you know limited liability company and corporation and i was what? like really I oh was my like, i was like okay do you know why you would have different business structures it's like well it depends on how many people are involved in the company and Whoa. what kind of liability you want to be exposed to because if you you know take on debt or if you go bankrupt or something you don't want them to take your personal assets and i was like well hot dang wow. this kid knows more in seventh grade than i did graduating college almost seriously it's kind of amazing so i'm like, oh, pretty wow. into that i'm like right on man right on so he's he's got rachel's like natural acumen for school i was a little more like I had to work for it pretty hard oh, to I, get like a solid B. It's a miracle I even graduated. <laughs> yeah. But uh, anyway, I don't know, it's kind of interesting. I'm I'm not like, like school is everything, but I'm also like, yeah, school definitely has its place and can be helpful. But you know, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta nuance that with every, with every kid. So I don't know. We'll see how things go. Hopefully the kids get Rachel's genes on that and not mine because whew, school was rough. For Ar me. Archer's, Archer's <clears throat> screwed either way because... <laughs> <laughs> neither Shannon and doesn't I have, don't have good genes to pull from on either no. side on that one you never know no. it could surprise you could surprise you never know I hope so um, anyway well that's all we got for you this week on the questions you can also email us at pencast at gulliapens.com if you're an audio listener especially um, send us questions and we might get to them in five years uh, or you can leave some comments um, love to get engagement from you all on these and uh, yeah if a question's good it's always good absolutely it won't go bad it's like a fine wine uh, and then that's going to lead us into our hypothetical question this week because we have one. Yeah. Okay. All right. This is from, I cannot pronounce it. Agachwasta. Yes. Agachwasta. Sure. Anyway, this person, this very fun person is giving us a hypothetical that says, if you could come up with an Urushi or Makie design for mm -hmm. a Namiki pen of your choice made especially for you, what would the design be? You wouldn't have to make the pen. It would just be custom made just for you. So this isn't like designing one to be sold kind of a thing. No, this custom made for literally you Literally one of a kind. Only. A Brian Goulet pen. It can be as pen. weird and obscure as possible. Absolutely. This is a good question. It is, it this is. is. And, and we did talk about it last week. And I wasn't, I, well, I'm not going to say that I was disappointed in your answer, Brian. Feels like you but, just did. Uh, I, I feels like you just feel did. like <laughs> I believe in you to the point where 
I have such faith in your creativity that <sighs> come on, man. I, I feel like you feel... put a little too much pressure on this here. <laughs> this is why this is why I don't have any tattoos. Because like <laughs> I think tattoos are cool. I look at people with tattoos. And I'm like, yeah, that would be awesome. But like, you need to get the mom heart. When I, when I legitimately have thought about getting a tattoo, I'm like, you know, it'd be cool barbed wire. I'm like, I don't know. Oh yeah, right. Nice tribal. A nice tribal <laughs> on my you know shoulder or something. Yeah, but I'm like, yeah, I just don't know what. Like, I there's do nothing the spider, that like, do the spider web elbow. Spider web elbow is always cool. It's timeless. It's original. It's I classic. think that's like some sort of like gang symbol or something. No, like, no, I, no, it's classic. What about the panther? I'm pretty sure. Claw on the panther. Oh Ow. gosh, wow. Everybody loves the old panther. What mom, should, mom heart. What I should do is get like my fingers tattooed so that it looks like I have inky fingers uh, all the time. <laughs> That, that could work. That yeah, would be that more would apt work. than anything else. No, like, um, all right. You you can give me your old one from last week, but well, it's not going to change. It's not like right, my whole right. being is embellish it a little bit. Give me some. Give me some details. All right. All right. So I'll I'll talk about what what Drew's ragging on me for now. I'm not ragging that, on you. I just I'm not I'm huh? I'm creative in a lot of ways. But I when just it comes hold to you just in such like, high regard when Brian. it comes to just like straight up visual art. <laughs> I'm gonna be honest. Like I'm not the I'm not the best choice for just coming up with an idea like this. All right, you know? give us what you got. So, I mean, obviously if it's something custom to me, it would be like- That's all, that's all that matters. My own interests and stuff my like that. My opinions don't matter, ignore me. Yes, they definitely don't. Um, <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, no, for me, I think, I mean, I love, I love craftsmanship. I love building stuff. I love woodworking. I don't know visually what this would even look like in Machia form, but I don't know. I just, I love tools and I love building things. I feel like there could be probably some more artistic way to express it than just having like a bunch of like saws and hammers all over the thing. But there's probably a story that could be told like in, in the, cause like in Japanese culture, craftsmanship is like super strong. Like mm -hmm. it's very valued. There's probably some story or theme or Japanese God or something around that, that is related to like building things or crafting things that would like resonate with me. I just haven't like researched it. I'm not really aware of it. So there's probably something in there that would make a lot of sense. Cause I love, I love building stuff. I love nature, like the woods. I love being in the woods around trees, all that kind of stuff. I love the mountains. So I feel like there's a lot that's like I'm in sure the general some, I'm vibe sure there's of some, Machia design. So what you're looking for, you want, you want like a legend or some tale of I think that would give, like a, give a more enriched element to this than what I, would naturally just be like, yeah, just like, you know, put Norm Abram on it with some saws and hammers, oh my God, you know, please, and though. planks of wood. That That's my Brian pragmatic, you know, answer. You know, answer. Um, <laughs> uh, there was that famous, uh, there was a famous samurai who sometimes fought with a wooden sword. I mean, just, just, I'm just, not, just, I'm not just, a fighter, to, like, I'm just, never... to, just to really insult somebody. I think it was I mean, uh, Musashi. He was like, just yeah. you know, whack somebody with a wooden sword. Be like, I'm that, I'm that I mean, good. Yeah. Okay. I don't know. That's not really woodworking. That's more just like, yeah, that's hitting, more like hitting somebody with a stick. That's more fighting. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, All right. like the well, crafting the... of, some, you know, All right. well, something relating to either like, you know, it doesn't even, I mean, woodworking is like definitely more my thing. I don't know why like, you didn't spend the week blacksmithing since last whatever. week looking up Japanese woodworking <laughs> storytelling lore. Yeah, of course. <laughs> That's I when you, knew. that no, should have you been your what, number one priority. You know what happened after we recorded this last week and went through and we, you know, we tried to save the audio and it was just like, it's just too much. It's too far gone. And as soon as we made the call to cut it, I was like, all right, cool. I don't have to do any extra time to prep for next week's pencast because we already did it all. And I didn't think about it because I had a lot of other stuff going on. So that's, that's why. All right. Well, let's, let, no, no, no. I, I, so I, I, you know, I think if there's some story that could be told in there, but <laughs> What would be cool is like have something craft related, but like the sawdust that's in the craft could be rotten. Like that would be okay. that would be pretty cool. There you go. See, that's that's a nice little you detail. I mean? There we go. Yeah, but I mean, yeah, there's definitely like somebody somebody more talented and thoughtful <laughs> than I could take this very raw idea yeah. and turn it into something much more elegant and beautiful. But you know, to me, it's sort of like the lioness and cubs pen. That, you know that they so had, you want a, they story. Had a couple. Of, I mean, that's that would fit the whole Yerushin okay. vibe, right? Like, sure, yeah. Other than you know, unless what else? I mean, what else are you gonna do? Just like paint a circular saw on a pen? Like, that's no. not. That doesn't seem great. You know, it seems kind of hokey. That's super hokey. But but you but know. you are a hokey. We just established that. Well, the hokey is the. I'm, I don't even know what a hokey actually is. <laughs> so even having gone to Virginia Tech, but that's <laughs> that's the mascot is the hokey bird. Um, it's basically a turkey. Anyway, oh. and yet they sell turkey legs at the football games. 
in a phenomenal i'll say i don't ha- i don't hate on some turkey legs turkey legs are yeah like straight up medieval style yeah. like ripping anyway i don't mind that tangent um yeah so i mean that kind of fits or i would just go like full tilt into my all my most obscure hobbies and put like rubik's cubes and welding and just like i would try and incorporate every obscure hobby I've rubik's ever had. cubes might actually look pretty cool or like you know maybe not even rubik's cubes but just like puzzles in general mm-hmm. i love puzzles of all kinds so there's probably like puzzles that fit more in the design vibe of a makie pen that could be incorporated because like japanese puzzles and like wooden puzzles and things like a puzzle boxes that's a big thing in japan mm-hmm. like there's probably some theming around that that could be pretty cool and mm-hmm. interesting so yeah like, that would be a little more a little more you know subtle than you know norm Abram. okay <laughs> We've got some specific non-specifics here. Did I do better? Did I did I do better than last time? Uh, not much. This is not it, this is not much of a difference. I will say you I did not prepare before. any more than you did last no, I didn't. time. I so just, there's I that. Just a little bit. All right. All right. Well, okay. Well, I'm going to stick with I'm my. I'm feeling judged right now, but you go are ahead, a little Drew. bit. You, go ahead. That's all well, right. Here's the thing. I have such an I have such an excellent response. Oh, anything you say wow. is going okay. to pale in comparison. Wow. Well, to, your humility is um, very striking in well, the situation. You shouldn't be surprised because you heard it last week. So I'm ready for this. So <laughs> I, for, I for, All right. forgot it completely. All right. You get ready then. <laughs> okay. Go ahead. You know, hold on to your butts, people. Mm, yeah. Okay. Oh, pick, yeah. Pick, oh, I remember ah, now. I remember yeah. now. It's not better. Oh, hush. It's not better hush. at all. Okay. Go ahead. Get out like, of here. All right, you all judge. All right. You all judge. You know, the, 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 you know, Japanese lion, you know, mm-hmm. with like, you know, but instead of a lion, we're just such same, a, same, be- goofy same beastly. <laughs> Go ahead. Quiet, Don't say you. this with a straight face. Quiet, you. Do it. I dare you. <laughs> you can't. You can't. Go ahead. Go ahead. I don't want to spoil it. Go ahead. I feel your look. Oh, I'm ju- same, now I'm judging hard. Go ahead. Right, the same I beastly claws, majestic fur. The wings of an eagle, but it's a corgi with giant, you know, teeth. Like saber tooth teeth? Yes, but, you know, corgi beast, like clawing, rotten streaks down the side of the barrel. And maybe its tail is on fire, like just blazing with Mm. abalone and something like just some majestic, maybe standing on top of a mountain. Like all, mm. you know, puffed out with its okay. furry chest bundle, just <laughs> bursting forth majesty. Wow. Oh, yeah. Okay. And just maybe like either sunburst behind it with Rodden or an explosion. Uh, an explosion would be good. Yeah. You, fire. Need to, like, you need to put this into. Oh, like he's some... on a volcano. He's on a volcano. Oh, a volcano. He's on a volcano. Of course. That's where he emerged. That's where the like a, the look, rotten spewing out of the volcano. Some like, there's no okay. You know? uh, kaiju, um, ancient uh, kaiju coming out of uh, a volcano. I'm pretty mm. sure. Maybe maybe Megalodon did that. I don't know. Not Megalodon. Mm. Megalon from Godzilla versus Megalon. Of course, yeah, of course. Uh, I'm sure there's some kaiju that comes out of a volcano. Mm. In this case, it'll be giant corgi beast, and he's emerging. <laughs> the volcano's erupting behind him, and he's like, "I'm here to crush Tokyo." Wow. Yeah. Wow. This is dramatic. It would be amazing. This sounds like something that you would like generate in like an AI artwork generator. I mean, it's in my head right now. I can, I can. Uh, go do that, man. We got to make that happen. That's where my brain is. My brain is visualizing <laughs> corgi lava beasts while yours is like, okay, well, how, how do I graduate with a degree? Right. You know, so. Yeah. Well, you know, we, we, you know, th- this is why society needs both of us. We, we work as a team. You can we? you can <laughs> run all, businesses, and I can imagine strengths. I can imagine goofy garbage. So uh, that's right. Look at us go. That's right. Two sides of the same coin. Knowing you, the corgi <laughs> thing is that's pretty epic. That's pretty epic. Uh, I just I guess I don't have as as vivid an imagination corgi as you do. Beast Machia, rotten explosion, lava. Fountain. Right. Well, in that vein, then I could go like lumberjack. There we go. Like, Paul Bunyan. You know, double like. There we go. Axe yes. With like. You Think know. of all the epic, you know, things that they've had on, <laughs> like you know, the shark pen or the the Kylan dragon, like mm. something epic. I don't know what animal I would choose though, because I can. You could have a, like a some random dude. It's got to have to be like. An an- what animal would represent? You don't really care about animals. My woodworking, like I mean, animals not like, don't care about me. No, animals no, I mean, got it out for me. I'm just saying you don't. You don't seem. You're not particularly passionate about <sighs> like, like I don't know. You never. You don't seem to channel wildlife very much. You just seem to be like you know. No, you're you're your no. own animal. You're out in the woods by yourself doing no, I mean, things. I, I appreciate an animal. I'm out there with. Right, what do you think would be your spirit animal? Oh boy, I don't know. Is that even a PC term? I don't know how PC that term is. Okay, what would be the animal that you most identify with? 
I genuinely don't know. Um, I often get referred to as some kind of gorilla or bull or <laughs> elephant, something large. <laughs> You're and not that big. Not graceful. Oh god. Generally hairy. Um, <laughs> And probably a gorilla is what I get referred to the most by my own children. <laughs> oh, no. Really, Ellie, whenever she sees a gorilla of some kind, she's like, hey, dad, that's, <laughs> uh, you know, that kind of a thing. Not <laughs> not subtly at all. You know? Oh, my God. I, mean, I got, like, really hairy arms and, you know, all this kind of stuff. And look at his dad. I lift heavy things all the time. Oh. You know. My, my family does that whenever oh. they see a banana. Oh, okay. Because yeah. one time Shannon said, like, I was like, I don't know, I said something about a banana and Shannon says, you're a banana. I was like, what? Why? Because you're long and dumb <laughs> that's right yeah, so i was like oh, that before. wow long and dumb so now wow. whenever like archer sees a banana she's like oh look it's dad he's long and dumb <sighs> see you little jerk i definitely have things like that with my kids where it's like it was like an innocuous comment like that but they like keep bringing it up to the point where i'm like okay like it feels offensive now like it feels like i'm being attacked just because they never let it go mm -mm -mm. but really i i know they're trying to be endearing yeah um that's probably what the kids don't have limits do that's they? like what the gorilla thing is yeah. for me and ellie uh, that happens but anyway yeah, that's fine yeah anyway well that's yeah. the hypothetical okay cool <laughs> Awesome. Good one. Yeah, let's <laughs> let's do that one again. At least I didn't get asked much about my one favorite, whatever the heck, you know. I mean, I'm I did ask about an animal, but you dodged that one effectively, so we yeah. can move on. Yeah, yeah, fair <laughs> enough. Fair enough. All right, cool. Um, let's uh do our little spotlight. We got some cool little Pina Labos to look at, so let's do that. All right. All right, Drew. <clears throat> Pina Labo. Here, we don't need to zoom in for this. Ah, we can just go. We got some enough. pictures we can throw All up right. on there. You take we those go. two. I'll okay. take these two. I got a penguin and I got a cat. We've got more, but I have the panda and the, is this the corgi? Yeah, this is the corgi. We've got a um, Shiba Inu as well. but I can't tell the difference between the two in, uh, in Pina Labo form. Yeah, it's hard to, it's hard to tell, but... Um, all right, so what's the rundown on these things? Well, you know what? It's going to be a little challenging to demonstrate since we did not bring any pens with us. You got one pen there. I but have it's one a tiny little pen. Rico that, oh, yeah. gosh. Okay, the did little... I, I didn't even bring my backpack in here. I literally don't even have a pen on my oh, person. Oh, my God. Gosh. All right, so I'll tell you how to not use it. We got so a toothbrush over there we could use. Basically, you've got a silicone squishy pen case with a zipper that allows you to somewhat decapitate your animal of choice. It folds back. <laughs> um, is, you've got this going on. And you've got this little button that you can press whoop, and pop it up. When you have a normal size pen in there, the pen will, the bunch of pens will kind of like eject and become a pen bouquet for your accessibility. If you put this in there, however, it's useless. And then, oh my God. <laughs> Oops. What in the world happened? Okay, if you put a small pit in there, <laughs> it'll you fire can, it out of there. <laughs> it'll fire it right out. This is like the Twisby Hold Swipe on. video. Um, ah, there we go. It didn't bounce it. Excuse me. Excuse me, <laughs> sir. <laughs> we become oh, children when God. we play with these things. There's going to be so much schmutz in my pen now. They feel so good, though. Like the oh. silicon on these things, it's like, it feels really good. Yeah, they're solid. Um, they'll stand up either way. This, there's a little bit of an elastic band here. And I, I it's believe for, it's for an eraser. Right? Yeah, it can be for something else, I'm sure. We've tested it, it does not fit cartridges. And even if it did, mm. you'd have to shove like 10 of them in there. So yeah. uh, just don't worry about that. Uh, if you have. Yeah, it's meant it's like you have a, use it as a pencil case and you want to stick an eraser in here. That's what it's that's what it's for. Even then, it's got to be a very specifically sized eraser. Oh. If you have an idea of like an alternate, more fountain penny thing that these can be used for, let us know. And we'll just say that it's supposed to be for that. And um, you'll get a prize. No, you won't. Um, but they're really cool cases. Uh, my son has the Corgi. Nice. Um, he loves it. My kids now, have a couple. They've got the black cat. The only unfortunate things. thing is, you know, we put uh, stickers on all of the things he brings to school if we think they are losable. Oh, yeah. This one absolutely is losable. Nothing sticks to this. You can't stick anything. Yeah, it's this. silicone, so like nothing will stick you to it. You write on it, right? Like a Sharpie or something. I haven't tried that, but I don't want to besmirch this regal, majestic yeah. corgi beast. Like Look right at on, this. Right on the bottom. This maybe? is what needs to be on a, on a Namiki. Look at him. The majesty. All right. Love it. You say so. Um, so, yeah, and it's easily packable. Now, granted, you're not going to want to put your Namikis and your fancy things in here because but they're going to click and clack against each other. You could, <laughs> so you certainly could do anything. Mm -hmm. But 
it's it's meant more for you know throw around everyday carry type yeah guns. great so i would absolutely put my kakuno in here i would absolutely yeah. put twisbees my, oh yeah absolutely lami so, safari is that sure, type of stuff for sure but it would be great to have your fountain pen in here with all of your other stuff if you wanted to carry mm -hmm. around your pencils or your roller balls and anything else um it's a good catch-all as long mm -hmm. as the things you're catching are uh of the more vertical and narrow nature yeah and these things are how much are these things? Twenty bucks a piece, somewhere in there. I didn't look that remember? up. Didn't look that up. What does the Goog tell us? I don't know. Make it a Goog. Um, we should know this. We should, but we have a lot of things. To Unilabo, nineteen ninety nine. I was that's one not penny bad. off. That's one penny not off. bad at all. We have, uh, yeah, we have how many of these different things do we have? I don't know that we carry every single version, but they just came out with a bunch. There's more. a lot. Yeah. I know we've got <laughs> ten different versions, but I think there is even more than that. But uh, yeah. Probably. I think there's some discontinued ones, maybe. Could very well be. Yeah. Anyway. But they're fun little gadgets. The bear is pretty cool. The brown bear. It's pretty fun. Looks like your Lamy bear a little bit. Oh, yeah. I like him. Yeah. There you go. He's so anyway, if you've got these, um, leave some comments because, you know, it's just the kind of thing that, like, this, this, this very much falls into the category of products that we're just like, all right, I have no idea how these are going to do. Well, we could very well be surprised. We know they're fun. We know we like them, but uh, we weren't. This wasn't like a. Oh, you know what? Thing. Fountain pen people are definitely going to like these. Yeah. So we'd we'll love to hear if you um, do enjoy them. Yeah. And if you are uh, using them for fountain penny things. There you go. That's what we got. Puny Labo. Yay! And we'll just dive into what's happening next. I guess. Yeah. We don't, need an, we don't need no stinking introduction. Nah, we'll just dive right in. So we've got two weeks worth of what's happening. I'm going to breeze through. That's a lot of happenings. It is a lot of happenings. I'm just going to breeze through my week before last okay. happenings. Yep. Um, I have a toilet that I was going to start working on. It's stupid and I hate it. I fixed half of it, but then realized the other half of it was non-fixable. I need oh. to replace a valve and I don't want to do that. So mm. the end, you told me I was going to have to cut the pipe. So... That's going to get delayed for a bit because I'm never going to feel like My shutting just, off the water to the house and actually doing that. I I, I know an affordable yet very curmudgeonly plumber mm. who you may just want to call because I'm at that point where I'm like, when yeah. I'm not putting off essential or when I'm not doing essential plumbing projects because of how unexcited I am about them, I'm like, I should probably just hire somebody yeah. because I'm, the way never, I look I'm at never going to get more motivated to do it. If I'm cutting a pipe, that means that I've passed the point of no return. Like that mm. needs to be repaired that day yeah. or else you're not going to have water until yeah. you repair that. So I got a, I got a very curmudgeonly non-politically dance around kind of a plumber. Like he'll say some things that probably like literally what I do. When I, when I wanted to do them, just all like new faucets in our bathroom, it was like the like, more like the waterfall type, mm -hmm. you know, and that doesn't have like the aerator or whatever. It just kind of mm -hmm. like, bleh, like comes yeah. out. <laughs> I, I was like, yeah, can you install these? You know, we've got one downstairs in our bathroom. We want them to match. And he was like, no, you're going to hate these. These things are stupid. He's like, these are the worst types of things. And I was just like, well, I already bought them and I'm paying you to install them. So just put it in, please. Like that's, oh, that's how this guy, but he was, he was pretty affordable and he's good at what he does. He's just. He doesn't dance around things. So if you're if you're on board for that, right. maybe I'll yeah, give that, that might be what I need to do. <laughs> um, also, we've got uh, somebody here whose husband is a plumber. So a couple actually, yeah, might need yeah, to look around there. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. that's dumb. Uh, my son got <laughs> sick and uh, threw up all night long. That was a miserable, miserable experience. Like literally every forty five seconds, he had the um, norovirus. Um, oh, it was awful. minutes. Right. Well, every 45 so minutes. 45 yes, seconds, sorry. Like, it felt like every 45 seconds. Sounds like he should be hospitalized. <laughs> even, even when he was a newborn, we didn't stay up as much as we did. It was <sighs> so, so awful. Luckily, Shannon and I, uh, mm -hmm. we, did, we did not catch it, but God, that was awful. Wow. And then we also got um, our three-year-old dog fixed. Um, that was expensive and annoying Gosh. and this we're all happened with in that. one weekend yeah last last weekend was stupid wow. so we're not even we're, okay we're, let's we're, just forget that yeah it never happened that was dumb but uh, how's hank pa doing now though is he doing okay hank is doing all right he yeah. still got the inflatable donut on his head he has oh. he has to wear that for uh they recommend two weeks um is that just so he doesn't like so he doesn't know, lick his incisions lick his, yeah yeah okay. or you get him irritated mm. Yeah, but he's good. He's a naturally very lazy dog anyway, so we're not super worried about it. But we, when we get Felix fixed, he's going to need to be, like, tied down because that thing is mm. a jumping bean. Yeah. Mm. Uh, last weekend, my wife went to New York with her friends to see a couple Broadway shows. So oh, I was cool. home alone with the child. Wow. Um, you could so have been home alone and lost in New York if you'd gone there. Hey! Uh, talk boy. Um, wow. Um, How much full circle? You need a talk boy. You need to get that. You need credit to card. That you got it. <laughs> 
<laughs> um, so we stayed home. Uh, I did take Archer out to um, a, uh, yeah, I guess it's a vintage toy store in Carytown, um, okay. just for something to do. It was wet and miserable, but you know he got excited about it. Um, took him over there. They had a bunch of old nin- Ninja Turtle toys, like from our childhood. And one of the ones I saw was a Ninja Turtle, kind of like in its pre-mutated form, where it was just like a regular turtle, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I remembered having one of those when I was a kid that transformed into a full-size turtle. Yeah, yeah. So I told him like that's what it was, and he's like, "Oh my gosh, how much is it?" And I'm like, "I don't know. It's in a glass case. It's probably like I don't know, fifty bucks or something because it's vintage." Mm. And the guy said, "Oh no, it's only ten dollars." So he's like, "Okay, I want to get it with his own money." So he got it. We paid. He's all excited. Um, and uh, I told him, I was like, hey, you know what? That can be my gift to you. You don't have to pay me back. And he's like, oh, yeah, thank you. Get in the car, wet, cold, rainy. He realizes it is not that toy. It is. It was from 94. It opened up into like a Polly Pocket Mighty Max sort oh, of situation gosh. with no accessories, <laughs> oh, no man. characters, just an empty play set that has no purpose. Wow. And that's a he was let down. He was cool for a little bit. But then when we got home, I guess it settled in and he oh, lost it. He started crying. Oh, and geez. I told him, like, just throw it away. I don't even care. It's a $10 mistake. Whatever. It's like getting a Happy Meal with a dumb toy. Just throw it away. Well, I don't even care. So he's like, okay. I was like, there you go. No, no worries. You didn't. I lost $10. It's fine. Let's move on. And then he's just like, I don't want to. He starts freaking out. Goes over the trash can. Like, I don't. And it had coffee oh, grounds man. on it. He starts freaking out even more. I'm like, oh, my God. <laughs> Oh, so I got it out of the trash well, can, brushed off the coffee grounds. I'm like, it's fine, it's fine. Do you want to find some other characters that you can play with? Yeah, I think I have some small. And I'm like, okay, good, 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 good. Let's just do that. And yeah. Wow. Oh, such an ordeal. Oh, no good God. deed goes unpunished, right? I mean, I, I get it. I, I would be disappointed sure. too. Like there was it's, other stuff. It's and, part of the human experience. Yeah, you know? so just... that was a bit of a bummer. Um, but uh, yeah, that happened. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah, that, that was a thing. I remember that happening. Like, man, buying stuff as a kid and like you think, I mean, especially back in the day, like I, I told him the wrong thing too. I thought it was the other thing. But yeah, it wasn't. Well, it looked like it, and it yeah, hadn't seen one since I was in fourth grade. So right. Whatever. Well, yeah, it happens. Yeah, it happens. Um, and then uh, let's see. Uh, oh, um, rabbit holes. So, uh, I have some pen friends I that, like that that could be that could be a, an alternate name for this pen. Cast. Man, I tell you, I, I I <laughs> I love my pen friends. I do, but some of y'all. Uh-oh. have told me about some things I just wish I didn't hear because it makes me too interested in them. <laughs> so we've got Brian K over yep. here who mm-hmm. started talking to me because he's a fountain pen nerd through and through yep. within a hobbyist. Started oh, yeah. got me into the whole shaving with the safety oh, yeah. razor thing. Oh, and he'll get you interested in some stuff too. Oh, yeah. It, it, yeah. so many of them will. Talk to somebody about, um, you know, certain types of jeans. I'm like saving up for a pair of expensive jeans now for some reason. Oh, boy. Okay. The same guy uh, got me into um, boot research. So I'm like saving up for a pair of fancy red wing boots, even though they're like $350. Yeah. I'm like, I don't need that. But I'm like, I'm so interested in them now. I'm like, that sounds fascinating. <laughs> like American made boots that'll last you a long time. They hurt you for six months while you break them in. But yeah, I'm into that. <laughs> Like, and then I'm shaving, ripping my face off. I'm like, oh, this will be worth it one day. <laughs> oh, gosh. And then uh, um, our friend uh, Caitlin Swigart, who has commented here m- yeah, numerous times, yeah. spoke to her husband now. Okay. And now I'm researching third-party Transformers toys. Yes, Brian. I spent all weekend. Third-party Transformers Third-party toys. Transformers toys. Okay. And I, I, I feel like I'm just, I'm, I'm too susceptible to these things. And I yeah, need to be. Pattern here. I need to be. The pattern is just me. The pattern is listening you, to you people. being told about something and then wanting it. Yeah, that seems to be the pattern. Right, well, here's the thing, Brian. <laughs> Ever since I was a kid, I wanted a transformer toy that looked like they did in the cartoon. Because in the cartoon, they just looked like a bunch of like seems squares logical. and rectangles all blocky together. Yeah. Like, yeah. But the toys never actually looked like that. Yeah. Because I mean, they had to transform. Right. But these like knockoff transformers, they actually look like that. Oh my gosh. And I'm like, this okay. is so cool. Okay. And uh, the the names are all wrong. Like instead oh, yeah. of it's instead of deviate enough from insta- the oh, trademark, dude. Not even know. deviating. Like Optimus Prime is David. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then Megatron is Agamemnon. <laughs> oh my gosh. Uh, no, there, I did see one. Bumblebee was Herbie, which makes sense because he's oh, okay. a he's a bug. Okay. Um, but wow. yeah, some of them are just like. Ridiculous. David. Yeah. I'm like, what? <laughs> um, uh, uh, I feel like Starscream was like, you know, 
uh, Lucifer. I'm like, I mean, he is a jerk, but okay, sure. <laughs> wow, that's aggressive. Uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at that up. And they're small. They're like that big, but they're like $50. And I'm like, why am I doing wow. that? I don't stop looking. Okay. But I didn't buy any. Because I'm, I know myself. I'm like, wait, Drew, just wait. If you really, really, really yeah. want one, you just need to wait and just reevaluate. It's a good practice. Yeah, I'm trying. Okay, I am probably gonna buy those boots though. Like, I, I mean, the boots. There's a there's a more practical yeah like application yeah. for having boots like that. So you know, um, for all that outdoor and that you like to do, all that yard work. I, I I do like. Well, I've been. <laughs> I do like having things that I don't need to worry about. Like I okay. like buying things that I can just be like, okay, this will be fine for a good long while. Like I'm Fair like that, that's where the safety Fair razor enough. thing came into play. Yeah. Which by the way, I'm doing that every yeah. e every time you, you now. You keeping up with that? Not destroying my face any longer. Okay. I bought like uh, BK gave me the um, handle. So that okay. was free. All right. I bought soap for $10. Okay. And I bought a pack of 100 razor blades also for $10. Wow. So that is $20 I spent that'll last me an entire year. How many uses do you get out of a razor blade? Is it like one yeah. or two shaves? You could, um, me only shaving twice a week, I could just use a new one every time if I wanted to probably. Hmm. Um, but no, I use about, I do about like four. Okay. Four per blade. That's not bad. Um, no. Um, so. Yeah, especially twice a week. So that's yeah. super practical. I yeah. like that. I like, you know, I like the idea Makes of um, boots like that. And I also like the idea of jeans that could last me a while too. Like I've never had like a pair of really nice jeans. So mm. I've been doing some research about like, you know what, let me buy one pair of really nice jeans and see if it makes a difference, see if they last longer. Um, but we'll see. I just I just fall right down these rabbit holes. And I know I'm not alone. I know a bunch of y'all are like this. I, I just I, need to stop talking to you. I don't know what you're talking about. I don't have any. You've got so many. Things like that. I have a lot of things where I, I'm I'm now at the point where I can recognize. Yours are way more productive I'm than like, mine, look though. At, well, yeah, that's true. That's <laughs> Yours, true. Actually, you create and build, and I'm just like spending money. I mean, in the past, I've had less productive hobbies. Like, I was really into car audio when I was in high school and college. Yeah, that's less productive. That is, I mean, no one needs to have a large subwoofer in their car. It's mm -hmm. not necessary for anything. It's just purely fun. Um, but then, yeah, I, most of my, I mean, I was pretty pragmatic at 15, 16 years old. I would, I wouldn't like go to the movie theater because I'd be like, I'm just going to like pay to see a movie and then that's it and it's over and I have nothing to show for wow, it. Wow. Okay. I forget most of it. So I'm going to go to Sears and walk around and look at the tools and buy a hammer. <laughs> And you know what? I'm still using that hammer that I bought when I was 15 years old. You, you, I, have a, you were, I, buy, I bought a toolbox. I bought a level that fits inside the toolbox. And you like were remarkably hammer. pragmatic yeah. at, a, at a young age. I mean, when Rachel and I first got married, she makes fun of me. But one, one of the things that I did when we first got married, we were living in an apartment at the time. Uh, I would go to estate auctions and estate sales and stuff like that. And I would look for tools and things like that, you know old coffee cans filled with screws and nails and stuff like that. I would buy them for like five bucks a pop and, you know, sort it all through because you'd get like a hundred bucks worth of hardware for like five bucks Wow! an estate auction. So I would go to do these things because I had no money and I had time. I had no kids at and that point. And you wanted a bunch of screws. And I was like, these are things that I'm going to use at some point. And lo and behold, I still have a lot of that stuff and I've used Do you still have some a coffee can full of screws somewhere? I've sorted through a lot of it actually. Wow, that's Just, impressive. I mean, literally a couple of weeks ago, I had all these old, um, so I found these, uh, it's something I got at the estate. I mean, it's literally like a, a boot box filled with nails and screws. Dang. And just like old, like rusty stuff. Oof. So I took and I soaked it all in white vinegar, which is a great way to remove rust from steel. It also so makes your ever, uh, hands smell for a long time. Oh, vinegar is the worst. I cleaned my I cleaned my coffee pot the other day, and oh, I I I, so I didn't think I touched it. Yeah. But I'm washing my hands again and again and again. I'm just like, it's pretty gross. It's up somewhere. Where is it? Where is it? And yeah. Yeah. And my coffee pot still yeah smelled like that for weeks. But I got all these like like square nails, like old school like, like hand, concrete nails. Like, no, like hand wrought nails, like the kind that you would have from like the you know, earlier 1900s and stuff like that. Oh my so God. You can, you can buy like square nails. They're more like rectangular. And instead of like round heads, yeah. they've got like square kind of chunky threads. They're like sort of like trapezoidal shaped. I thought those were all but, for concrete. Um, no, no. Oh, okay. No, they make them for like, you know, whatever. But so, yeah, I have like a lot of those. And so I like cleaned them all up and sorted them by size and all that, you know, stuff that I, I mean, literally a couple of weeks ago, I just went through and did that for stuff that I bought like when Rachel and I first got married like Dang. 15 years ago. So yeah, so I saved a lot of that stuff. So I'm overly pragmatic in that respect. But at the same time, I got plenty of hobbies that have no purpose whatsoever. Join the club. You're in good company. Yeah. yeah.
Indeed. Looking at you right there. Indeed. What are your obscure um, hobbies? Post yes. in the comments. Oh yeah, please. Yeah, because y'all got some. Well, we, we know we, we know there's at least one IRC <laughs> uh, mechanic out there. <sighs> Stuff like that. I look at that and I watch some YouTube videos and I'm like, I feel myself getting pulled in and I'm like, nope. We gotta also stop. know I got to stop. I can't indulge in even one aspect of this other than observing. We know a video living like RC mechanics. I know the <laughs> bunch of y'all are knitters. I know um, mm -hmm. Caitlin mentioned her. She book binds just like randomly. Like, oh yeah, oh, just yep. leather bound. Make that's my own cool. leather bound oh, books. Like cool. it's wild. That's cool. Working with leather. Oh yeah, lots of leather workers. I could see that glass. Blowing. We've got we've got some uh, we've got some um, some welders out there too. Welding. Uh, Plenty of welding. That I did indulge in. I'm I'm oh, deep yeah. in that now. Um, yeah. But anyway, let's okay. Keep this keep moving. moving. I just wanted to mention um, <laughs> uh, no pen cast next week. Yep. So this is the last opportunity I will get to say that I will be at the Baltimore Pen Show. If mm -hmm. you will be there, say hi. I will be there. When and is the I will also say hi. Baltimore Pen Show is next weekend. Mar yeah. Not this weekend. Not this weekend. Next weekend. Yes. March 5th, 6th, 7th, 8th, 9th, 10th, 11th. It's on the website. Somewhere over Baltimore there. Pen Show. Wait, no, not, no, this weekend's the... Or whatever. This weekend's when is the 5th. So that would be like the 10th or something is like that. Really? No. No. It's the 28th today. 20, oh my gosh. So yeah, this weekend's the... It's March. It's March already. Almost. Right now, yes. We're filming this the yes. last day of... I was, there's only 28 days in February. Yep. It didn't like fully register in my brain. Yeah. Until just now, like, so it's yeah, March so the tomorrow. Baltimore show is gonna be like the tenth or anything. Anyway, I'll be there. I'm not gonna have a, <laughs> I'm not gonna have a booth or anything, but I'll be walking around. Say hi, say what's up. Maybe yep. I'll have some stickers or something. Are you gonna wear a loud shirt? Probably not. Time? I don't like loud shirts. <laughs> okay, my turn. Yes. All right. Um, I've been busy. I've been working on development reviews. We do like annual development reviews, and we gotta do pay compensation evaluations and Ooh. all this type of stuff. Yeah, Ooh. it is interesting. Um, but uh, yeah, a lot of extra time on that. Try to be very thoughtful around this time. Uh, so, and I have a lot of direct reports. So. And we're gonna do um, my evaluation live on camera so you can't say anything negative about me. Yep, live flogging. Or else you'll Drew. feel real bad about it. Well, will, and everybody will be like, how dare you will, say that about Drew Brown? We'll have an airing of grievances with Drew. That's a Seinfeld reference that you would understand if you watched I've the show. I've heard it because everybody makes that references. Well. And I know about the tree pole, whatever. Oh, you forgot to mention that you're watching Severance now. I did start watching After Severance. much, yes. much prodding on my part. Watching that and watching Ted Lasso because- uh, Oh, that's awesome. My yeah, brother really has- uh, I don't like sports, but Ted Lasso is awesome. You know what? Sports movies are always great though. Oh yeah. I love sports it's, it's, movies. It's, it's ripe for drama, yeah. you know? So that makes sense. The real thing's just boring. Yeah, same. Um, okay. I mean, it's not boring. I mean, it's exciting, but whatever. It does not keep my attention. Okay. Um, so yeah, spending a lot of time on there, blah, blah, blah. That's kind of boring for y'all, but um, I've been cutting down more trees. <gasps> what? Yeah, super exciting. Um, I've had some interesting experiences. They're like, you know, they're like, they're like- uh, Nothing dangerous, I hope. Nothing harrowing. I mean, nothing harrowing, nothing unsafe. He I said mean, there's with a question element. mark in his well, brain. I want to say like driving a car is dangerous. Like car accidents happen. Like, so like, you, can you know, that card. it is an activity that has an element of danger to it. Oh, so I take more safety precautions to mitigate the danger. But I'm, all, I'm always conscious that like working with trees is dangerous. You really do. I remember you showed me a video one time and you were wearing like a full safety orange oh, yeah. like jumpsuit. I wear boots, steel toe boots, like high boots. And you're out there by yourself. Like no, you're not in chaps. any danger of being like mistaken for anybody, but you're, you take, oh, no, no, no. You take caution no. as though. Sure. That's impressive. Yeah. Well, I mean, like the, they don't have to be orange. It could be any color, but you know, still. I wear chainsaw chaps, which is like, they make them out of a special material. It's like a fiberglass, like weave inside the, the pants. What? So that if your chainsaw chain hits your legs, the, the fiberglass like gets all caught up in the chain and it gums it up and stops it up. So there's like special chainsaw gear you wear, you know, for that purpose. Cause if the, wow. if the chainsaw kicks back or does something crazy, you know, you won't cut off your leg. So that's why you that's why you wear that type of gear. I never knew so that. I, that. I wear I always wear a helmet now when I'm in the woods because I've had some close calls. Because even when you're felling a tree, even if the tree, even if there's not like those branches and stuff, just the tree falling can hit other trees and break branches. There can be vines that can pull things. Yeah. And let me tell you, a stick of pretty much any size falling from like 80 or 90 feet in the air hurts. It hurts a lot. So I've had uh, had some some close calls in the past. You've so had I some things fall on you. Yeah, I mean, it's it's happening. So you, there's a lot you have to be conscious of and thinking about. So I try to take pictures and shoot some video of things as I do them, but it's always secondary to, you know, 
making sure that I'm safe and stuff like that. So um, I've fallen, a bu- I have a bunch of old pines that are like dying and so I'm felling them just to make room for the newer, younger trees to grow up and all that kind of stuff. So I've had some interesting ones. Um, I have, you know, I got a picture of a pile here that's like probably six feet tall by at this point, 10 feet deep of just logs from the trees, not even the branches. That's a whole other thing. But I have like three piles like this size. What are you gonna do with all that? Rachel has been asking me the same thing. (laughs) Uh, Moving on. Uh, (laughs) I'm like, well, what I'm doing about it, you're watching it happen. I'm I'm making a pile. I'm making a pile and I don't know what it's going to happen. Probably move it to another location. I might. Yeah. I mean, so having logs like that can be handy if you like really muddy sections of like you know, parts you're trying to cross, you can lay logs down, you know, and like make like little road bridges type things. But I'm like, I could make like an entire like racetrack now with logs. Um, anyway. And then, you know, I've been taking some trees down and stuff, but the crazy thing is these trees, like they'll fall, but a lot of times there's so many other trees, they just get hung up on stuff. So I had this one I mentioned, I fell it across my driveway, which is a very efficient way to do it, by the way. So like if I, I've got trees, a lot of trees are right along my driveway. I got a paved driveway, thankfully. And if I drop the tree yeah. in the driveway, oh yeah, good job, Drew. <laughs> um, and so if I drop the tree there, I can like cut the tree up and I can move all the logs and do all that very easily. Whereas if I drop it the other direction into the woods, now I'm navigating uncertain terrain yeah. and I can't really get any like equipments or any of that kind of stuff. And it's so much harder to haul it out. Also, so it's like- you've I'm got, dropping everything into the driveway. You've got, you know, about, you know, 20 or 30 feet where nothing is getting knocked down or anything. Yeah, exactly, like exactly. You're, it, you're minimizing- If I drop it across the driveway, there's no trees so it can get momentum. And then when it hits other trees, it can sometimes, you know, break through Push and through, then actually yeah. go onto the ground. But this one I have here was interesting. I timed it perfectly where Rachel needed to go and bring Joseph somewhere. Oh, so no. I, I, I'm always conscious of what's happening in the driveway when I do this, of course, and I put cones up and all that. But just the timing of it, I dropped the tree and I thought it had the momentum to fall all the way down, but it just got completely hung up in the tree that was across the driveway Mm. to the point where the momentum from it actually snapped off the top of the tree that I dropped and dropped it onto the driveway, completely blocking it. So it's like a 20 foot huge chunk there. And then I had this other massive, like probably what was left of it was maybe 60 feet tall, draped completely across the driveway. And I was like, well, I got to get like that the dri- out of the way. Well, the, or, no, right here. This, okay. like, this oh, it was is over the driveway. So like the stump is, is still attached to the stump and the thing is hanging above the driveway mm. where like at any moment it could just like fall down. That's what down. we call so I'm precarious. Like, yeah. So I'm like, well, Rachel, you're definitely not driving under this. So I was like, okay. Uh. And I, as soon as the thing got hung up, I was like, crap, what time is it? I was like, oh, Rachel needs to bring Joseph somewhere in like 10 minutes. And I was like, all right, let me get working on this. So I was like in the process of moving that out oh, of there. Man. And, and, but basically in order to get rid of that, what you have to do is you have to, you have to bucket down and cut like four feet off at the bottom. Bucket down? Yeah, you bucket, bucket, B-U-C-K, yeah, bucket. Right? Okay. Into what are called cants. A cant is a Buc- small portion of log. Bucket down into cants. So you bucket, bucket down into cants. Uh-huh. Yep. Yeah. And then you, <laughs> uh, <laughs> you, um, you basically are like dropping off small chunks of the tree to hopefully either like shake it loose so it drops down completely. You fringe the, or you, fringe the gimbals. That's right, exactly. You get it. Yeah. Um, or you, you cut it down enough to where then I've got room to like then pull it back and pull it out so then it drops out. So I was in the process of doing all that and it was cool because Rachel usually is just like whatever Brian's doing his thing and I show her pictures and she's like, that sounds insane. You know, but this is the first time she'd like sat there and watched me as I was doing it and she was like, yeah, I hope you're being safe out there because oh, like, that seems kind of crazy. You know, whatever. Um, <laughs> and then whatever. I had another one where I, I dropped a tree and there was another tree that had like kind of a wide branch like this, mm-hmm. a small beach tree. And I dropped this huge pine and it just I timed it like not at, on purpose, but it just went right into the split of the tree and it just like sheared off this huge trunk and just like split this other tree in half. And I was Is like, it? whoop. I was like, I don't know if that tree's going to make it now because it like, it's got this huge. So now like, now it's targeted, strip. it's targeted for deletion now. Yeah. I'm keeping an eye on it, but uh-huh. we'll see how it goes. But just, you know, it keeps things interesting. You're um, like you yeah. next. But then I've been putting my woodworking to some actual like useful, practical, beneficial to the world. Um, So I'll have a picture here with some interesting backgrounds that I've created for photography. So I basically have taken locally filled, artisanally crafted um, logs. So I've got one here on the left side. This is red oak. 
The one in the middle, this is a spalted maple. That spalted maple looks cool. The spalted maple is crazy looking. And then I've got cherry on the right side, mm. there, um, which is nice and I rich, like cherry. rich color. Um, so these are just, I had slabs of these and I like resawed them into like maybe quarter inch thick, you know, half inch thick pieces. And then I, I, what I do is I take one log and I slice it, you know, just like you would slice cheese, right? Mm -hmm. And then because you've got the grain pattern in there and you can definitely see it with the maple, um, it's all the same log. And then I do what's called book matching. So basically you slice it and then you open it up like a book. And then whatever grain is at the edge will like be more continuous. So that's called book matching. So how do you yeah, slice open wood happens. like a book? Well, you slice it. So like I take a piece of wood, say it's two inches thick, right? You know, I run it on a bandsaw, you know, and I slice off like say a quarter inch thick of it or a half inch thick or something like that. So then I'm, I'm literally just like slicing it, just like you would have like a meat deli slicer. Yeah. You know, you're running it through and you're slicing it off. Right. So what you have is you, you know, you're basically taking off like whatever the, the, the end of it and then you open it up. So if say, if it's, say if it's eight or 10 inches wide, it then becomes 20 inches wide, right? You're not, you're not understanding no what idea I'm describing what you're here? About. No. I wish, no, I, had, I, wish I had a better visual aid. So like pretend my hands are the wood, you're cutting it, uh -huh. and then as soon as you make the cut, you just go boop. So like you just that. cut it in half. You cut it in half, but then you you open it up so that the ed, the same ed, you know. Whereas if you cut it in half and then you laid it like that, the grain wouldn't be continuous. Oh, okay. So you you cut it in half and then you open it up so that the edge the grain is continuous. And you just glue it together. And then you glue the edges. Yeah. Well, this I did like a plywood backing, so I'm gluing it. You know, because I cut it pretty thin, oh. and I did plywood backing. So, oh, yeah. okay. But it allows it to like the red oak here, so it allows it to have like a more continuous grain. Anyway, this is all boring for everybody, but um, anyway, so you'll see some new uh, wood like backgrounds in some of our photos and stuff. So photographers have been having a blast doing that, and they're like, "Oh, we'd love some more other small pieces of wood that we oh, can like prop sure pens up against and all that." So and I was much. like, "Okay, more wood? Yeah, I'll go do that." <laughs> um, <laughs> And then the most notable thing, this is all that I did. Well, I mean, do another woodworking tree cutting and stuff like that. All that I did last week. But the most notable thing that I had happened since the last recording we did um, is I was a chaperone on my oh, daughter's chaperone. Fifth, fifth grade field trip. Oh, my. That was an experience. Where'd you go? Uh, we went to the Science Museum of oh, Virginia. Cool. Uh, it was an absolute blast. Yeah. I love the Science Museum. And it's like, I how, mean, long, well, how long had it been since you've been there? It has. Well, so I remember I took the kids there for like a New Year's, a noontime New Year's. Oh, Eve I remember thing, that. Like I hated five that. Five years ago. Oh, I hated that. And it was kind of madness. But I mean, oh, it was absolutely insane. It was crazy. And so we they did dropped really... all the bouncy balls. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. Did your kids get any of them? Because Archer didn't, and he flipped out. No, no, no. We were like up on the up on the second. Oh, we were down there, and like he that. wanted one so bad, and they bounced oh. it where and only the kids in the front got them. So it's yeah, like, what is the point? Sorry. Why would they do this? They're just like yeah, guaranteeing yeah, yeah. that <laughs> hundred children get upset yeah and their parents are then Sounds left awesome. with a kid that didn't get a bouncy ball yeah because all the kids in the front are just walking around with piles of bouncy balls it's, i'm oh, sorry that's I, pretty I, oh, so somebody's bitter um i didn't even know that they, you got to keep the bouncy balls anyway yeah um so anyway basically Some the science kids. museum it's it's like it's meant as like a hands-on way for kids to get to experience science yeah. things so but they had some they had some pretty i remember going there as a kid and i thought it was amazing oh yeah and i loved it and i remember getting like space ice cream like dehydrated mm -hmm. ice cream and stuff uh, like that all yep. that crap yep. um that globe that like glass. floated in the air yeah, yeah yeah and you'd like touch the static ball and make oh, your yeah. air stand up and all mm -hmm. that kind of stuff um but none of that's there now no i mean it's updated but it's there's some cool stuff there did you like, get to did you get to oh that's what you told i did me. some stuff did you do the, the uh robot air hockey thing I, yes and so they have this well i didn't get to play because oh, there was like a okay. lot so my experience there, I was like, oh my gosh, everything here is so cool. I want to play with it all. But I was like, I, so my chaperone group, I had five kids to watch. My daughter and come up a couple of friends and a couple of kids I didn't know. Um, and it was, you know, it was an interesting mix of kids. Um, but my whole time I was just like, I can't lose any kids. I can't lose any kids. Cause like, I don't even have a map of the place. Yeah. Like I have my memory of what this place was like. There's kids running around everywhere. And like, we at least, at least you know, my daughter's school had the cognizance to like, they told everybody to wear the same color shirt. That's good. So I was like, okay, at least I can narrow that down. But it's like, I just met some of these kids that morning and now I've got to like not lose them in this public place. And so I'm like, the whole time I'm pretty paranoid. Like all I have to do is just like, don't lose the kids, don't yeah. lose the kids. But also like, I'm trying to like involve them and help them have fun and make sure that they're all feeling included and all that kind of stuff. So it was, 
I did that and it was a couple hours and afterwards I was like, oh my gosh, how do teachers do this? This is a very stressful. Like I would rather do taxes all day than I would rather get do punched. This. Like, I mean, it was a blast. I had a lot of fun, but it was pretty stressful. Just like the responsibility of all those kids and all that kind of stuff. But they had a blast and it was very endearing because I think like, you know, Ellie, she's like really an independent kid, but she has these moments where like she doesn't want to say that she wants me to like do stuff or wants me to be involved in things. And she like, she's snarky with me and all that. Mm. She's more like snuggly and stuff with her mom. But with me now, she like gives me a hard time. That's kind of like more the way she expresses her love. Right. Um, but, you know, when she kind of first and this is like I've got so much going on right now too is like how am I going to take a day to go do a chaperone thing but you know it was like she in in as much as she would she really hinted that she wanted me to do it and I was like you know I was like she's in fifth grade like this is probably going to be the last time that there's going to be a field trip that I can really do like with and my kid. probably Maybe the last like, one she's going to hint that she hit, wants you at yeah I mean, like that's probably not going to happen again so I was like yeah. I've just got to make it work yeah and so it was it ended up being just a great experience like a very bonding thing that we got to have and it was cool to see her like in her element with her kids and you know because I don't you know, your kids get to a certain age and you're like, I don't know how they act around You could other be a kids. terrible human at school for all I know. Yeah. yeah. Cause I, she gets like the clean desk award and stuff like that at school. And I'm like, really? Cause, Cause like, this uh, living room is full of socks. <laughs> you know, it's selective, that kind of thing. But you know, it, um, did she do the thing where you get to race the little red line that represents? Yeah. So they have she's like, super competitive. I'm like, she's very did she just do that forever without refusing no, to She was great. Submit? She wasn't like, no, she was really, really good. You know, she like, there were other, I mean, they had a lot of cool things. So like some of the cool stuff that they had there, they had a robot air hockey machine. Mm -hmm. So like an AI sort of powered thing that you could play and nobody could beat it. Like nobody could even score on this robot. It was kind of crazy. I've seen it done once. Yeah. And I wanted to do it so bad, but there was, there was a so line. You wouldn't give up either. You wouldn't stop. You'd be I like, have, I'm going to beat this robot. I have drawn blood All those kids. on myself and my opponent <laughs> during air hockey games. I get aggressive oh i know i've played air hockey, hockey against yeah. you like the, 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 I, the thing yeah. just went off the table like more than it scored yeah and i have really long arms so i can really uh, yeah anyway um i didn't get to do it though and it was just like probably for the best yeah there was so much to do it was like we had to like really kind of book it through yeah. there and get a chance to do stuff so anyway um that was really cool they had this the whole like light exposition type thing just learning about lasers and different forms of light and stuff like that and they literally had this like room that was dark with fake fog and stuff like that with lasers to like straight up mission impossible style oh wow and you had to try to like crawl your way through the lasers without like if you broke the laser then the red light would go off and that kind of thing so you had to like try to get through this room oh, that's cool straight up like you know that kind of thing that was super cool um they had all kinds of other things that were like musical instrument related or they had this one crazy thing where you would stand on this platform and it would measure your height. And then you had to try to get into as small of a ball as you could. And it would tell you like what size container that you could fit in. The kids had a blast with that. Um, one kid was like a dog crate. Another one was like a golf equipment bag. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. I forget what Ellie was. She's, you know, she's got my build. So she was in a so petite. larger, you know, structure. <laughs> I forget what it was, but uh, the kids had a blast with that. And they had a giant hamster wheel, like a human powered hamster oh wheel. Oh my God. Thing. My kids, they love our hamster and they had- I need to go back there. They didn't have any of that when I last it's went. It's super cool. Like I would legitimately go back with my kids and oh, do dang. it again. Cause it's, it was really fun. It was really fun. Um, and then <laughs> one of my proud like dad moments was they had this machine where you could see how many pounds you could bench oh, press. Oh, here we go. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I was going to like not make it a big deal, but they they basically like you lean your back against the wood and you push these bars out mm -hmm. and it tells you how many pounds of pressure that you can do. And Ellie did it and she was like, you know, it tracks like the different whatever, whatever kids did it previously. It doesn't track your name or anything. And she did it and she was like top for the day or whatever. It was like a, she, she pressed like 124 pounds or something. This girl is strong. Um, and then she was like, daddy, you do it. And I was like, all right, let's do it. It's 367 pounds. Nice. <laughs> and so I skewed like all the rest of the readings for the day. I you was ruined like, it. All right. Okay. There we go. That's so funny. That was kind of fun. So yeah, it was just, for me, it was just like super memorable to just spend that time with my daughter and just get to see her like in her element yeah. at school. It was like, I don't know. That was really rewarding. So I'm really glad I did that. Was she as 
bossy as she is with Joseph or did she kind of, was she a little bit more no, amenable? she was great. I think it's, yeah. you know, cause it's like she, yeah, she bosses her older brother around yeah. quite a bit and he's so compliant and yeah. so good. Um, you know, so she's a strong personality, but she was, she was good. But she was, you know, she had leadership, you know, qualities to her. But she was very inclu- <laughs> she was very inclusive with all her friends, and I was like, okay, I see why all our teachers. That's love when you're her bossy and, and so nice much. about it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but I mean, she just she was just in her element. And I was like, this is really cool to see. Like, I felt like I got to be like a casual observer to That's her fun. in that environment. Um, yeah, you know, which was pretty neat. That's always but, cool for me too because Archer's an yeah. only child, so I never get to observe him. Right, with like Peters. playing with yeah, yeah. So yeah, it's, yeah, it's pretty neat. I value that. And I got. But another highlight for me, like sitting on the bus with a kid, I had to sit next to like a random kid. I, like we rode a school bus over there and I was like, I have not sat on a school bus in 20 years or more. Maybe that was an experience. Um, I don't fit well in the seats. It's kind of like riding in an airplane, but um, we totally, the kids were like trying to get the trucks to honk. Oh yeah. The, and they totally did. Oh, and, some things yeah, never changed. Yeah. I was like, wow. Yeah, I just I remember all the classic oh, yeah. things. So anyway, I've gone on too much, but it was a blast. All right, I've um, got a couple of quick Omni updates and then uh, we'll wrap this sucker up. All right, well, as Drew already mentioned, we're not going to be doing a pencast next week scheduled, uh, but we'll be back the following week. Um, we do have a video that we published last week on the Jinhao X159 with the big number eight size nib. Um, we are planning, I'm not sure if we're going to publish it this week, maybe next week. But we're going to have a video on the best pens for high maintenance inks, which Drew is. That's done. a super common question that I get. So yeah, hopefully gonna be, this will help. It's going to be a good one. Yeah. And then we got, we have several other videos. We have videos planned basically through April. So we've got a bunch in the wings and they'll be coming out. But yep, that is all happening. And we'll wrap this thing up. Well, we want to thank all of you for watching. So please leave us some feedback in the comments or shoot us an email. Let us know how we're doing. Ask us some questions so that we can answer them on the show at some point between now and five years from now. Um, check out gulepens.com for fountain pens, ink, paper, all that good stuff, puny labo cases. Um, subscribe to YouTube, whatever, Instagram, all that stuff. And uh, I have a random fun fact, Drew. Bring it. You ready? Yes. It comes from the same Smithsonian article that I found about the forks. Fantastic. Okay. I want to hear it. This is another, uh, another dining related thing. Let's do it. Um, so apparently eating on a bare table was once something only a peasant would do. Like a, like a grizzly? Ta- a tablecloth-less table. Oh. B-A-R-E. Oh, man. So medieval diners would be horrified at our casual attitude towards table linens today. Mm. For knights and their ladies, good linen was a sign of good breeding. I don't know how that association was made, but I'm sure it made a sense at the time in Probably some not. way. If you could afford it, and maybe even if you couldn't, the table would be covered by a white tablecloth, pleated for a little extra oomph. A covered cloth was thought to impair the, sorry, a colored cloth was thought to impair the appetite. Um, The exception to the white only rule was that in rural areas, the top cloth might be woven with colorful stripes, plaid, or checks. Uh, diners sat along one side of the table and the tablecloth hung to the floor on that side. So like tablecloth draped over your legs kind of a thing Um, so that it would protect guests from the drafts that would come through of their Mm. inevitably drafty homes and keep the animals from walking on their feet because apparently there were animals just walking around, which you have animals walking around your house. You could probably drape some tablecloths on your feet. I will will say that uh, 50% (laughs) of the adults in my home decide that it's okay to sometimes feed said animals from the table. Oh. The other 50% are very opposed to it mm. because that 50% knows that it creates bad habits and poor behavior. Mm. How about that? However, the other 50% tends to not care and does it anyway. Mm. Okay. Not to name any names, Not right? going to name any names. <laughs> we'll say her name. 100% of dogs are looking for food. At your table. All However, one hundred percent of the dogs only request food from fifty percent of the adults oh. because the other fifty percent adults are not giving in mm. to this behavior. Okay, doesn't want to reinforce this behavior. <laughs> there you go. It's mm. like my dog with the baloney. Oh right, I told you about this. <laughs> yes, you did. My, my dog that we had her on special diet food, and she was getting baloney from <laughs> our neighbor. <laughs> 
in his beer fridge. <laughs> oh my goodness. Anyway, well, uh, thank you all. We've had a blast. I'm glad to be back doing this again. And then uh, we'll take a week off and we'll be back. Nice long one for yeah. you this week. There Make you go. Got to hold time. you over. Yeah. Anyway, thanks for watching and right on. <laughs>